Well, hello from Emerald Hill Skies. I'm looking out the uh, window over here, and the sun is just right there at the horizon. At least I can see it through the tree treetops. So I'm going to check the audio, make sure that our audio is good here. Maybe you guys, I see uh, we've got, yeah, sounds like we got audio. Um, so look, at, we've already got seven or so people here that uh, are already checked in. So be sure and tell where you are. I see Gerard Joseph there. Gerard, remind us where you are. We've got Stan from Two Rivers Observatory also. And uh, yeah, let's get going. I did a couple of, uh, what do you call them, shorts? It's a dumb name if you ask me. Uh, YouTube's little version of TikTok style videos, 60 second things, just rolling off the roof of the observatory and raising up the uh, uh, adjustable height pier so you can see a little more of that. It's a, uh, it's a Telestation 2 observatory. This is a snapshot of it at dusk on another night. But you can see the way we've rolled off the roof and raised up the pier. And it's a Rasa 11, Celestron Rasa 11 with, on the end, uh, the business end of the thing is a uh, Octopi Astro camera interface with uh, ZWOASI 2600 MC Pro Astro specific one shot color camera. And on top of the scope, uh, there is a little outrigger set up with, uh, it's like a little equipment plate with a ZWOASI 178 monochrome camera with that lens that comes with that camera. It's uh, about a 150 degree uh, view of the night sky. So that's what we're showing when we're showing the sky cam view. And I've got it really stopped down uh, really like 0.1, I forget, milliseconds or something. We're looking at the western sky waiting for, for darkness to descend. It looks like our first object of the Messier list, M74, is going to set around 8.04 p.m. And as you can see, we still have a lot of darkness there. I mean, a lot of sunlight there, sorry. Um, I'm going to switch to the screen and obviously we don't have anything yet to plate solve on so who knows if we're anywhere in the right ballpark that's one millisecond at 100 gain let's go ahead and switch to one second I think it'll still be pretty bright yeah that's one second Let's go back to 0.5 seconds. What we're doing is waiting for it to get dark enough to try our best to pick up M74, but with sunset just being at, uh, I guess, officially 8.07 officially. And it's right out there along the very edge. I don't know if I take my camera off for a second. Oh, you're not gonna be able to look out that uh, that window and see, but it's just a big orange ball there on the on the horizon, and I've got a few treetops in the direction of the sun. So um, we could say a little bit about uh, Charles Messier. Now that's 0.2 seconds, so it is getting dark out there. That's 0.4 seconds. And now this is 0.5 seconds, so um, we could say a thing about uh, Charles Messier. Uh, kind of look at this from the Stephen James O'Meara book. Messier was, of course, you guys already know this. I'm just saying it for the benefit of those who might check in. Welcome, PureTech. Vito, good to have you here. And Gerard, it looks like you are from... Uh, I forget where you're from, Gerard. Where are you observing from? Northeastern Michigan, that's right. Uh, Two Rivers Observatory. Stan, you're from Cape Breton Island on Nova Scotia. What a cool place to be from. My goodness, that's awesome. And Vito, of course, from up in Chicago with PureTech, the people who designed that observatory and built it, uh, constructed it right there in their, in their factory. Love it. Thanks for being here, Vito. 
So you know that Charles Messier was a comet hunter and uh, uh, the comet would come back in 1758, Halley's Comet. And by this time, Messier had become a clerk at uh, the Marine Observatory. And he worked for um, Joseph Nicholas de Lisle at the Hotel de Cluny. Hotel de Cluny, however you say that, in Paris. And de Lisle was 70. He took Messi under his wing in 1751 and began to shape his career. By 1754, Messier was highly skilled and respected as an observer, and his main pursuit was comets. There goes the sun. That's the last of the orange ball. So here's to be tracking with um, M74 now, but sure couldn't tell it, can you? All you see there is just a lot of, well, that's weird. At 0.1 second, it goes dark. At 0.2 second, it's suddenly light. What do you make of that? Weird. So are they saying if I go 0.15 seconds, that it's halfway in between? Huh. 0.14 seconds? That must be some kind of break point in the... 0.12 seconds must be some kind of break point in the camera's electronics or something. 0.1 second, it just goes. There we go. It's still white there. Anyway, uh, M74 is supposed to set at 8.04 p.m., I think. So I think we've lost it. Bummer, huh? Because we haven't even gotten to focus, obviously. We, we don't see anything in the sky yet to focus on. I don't know if we went on a brighter star. If we could focus somewhere else and then come back to this. Let's try that. Let's go to Stellarium and see what we've got that would be bright. I wonder, for instance, Rigel or Sirius. How about that? So we'll go Control Z or to bring up that little panel and we'll say um, slew to the current object. And that should take the scope. You can see it moving there off in the direction of um, Sirius in Canis Major. Maybe we'll be able to see something to focus on there. So we'll at least be in the range. So there's the sky cam. I've got it stopped down so you can see the sun setting there, the glare of the sun setting rather. Just, uh, you guys are saying there are some lags in the, hmm. So is anybody else experiencing any of those video lags? That's sad. I'm going to go um, for a second here and look at the report. Stream health. It says stream is healthy, stream status excellent. So I don't know what could be causing that. Hmm. Anyway, it says it's healthy. I don't know. It says excellent connection. So I don't know what I can do about that here, guys. Um, Oh, look, I think that might be 
serious there, huh? So let's go back up to one, one second. Boy, I just can't get the, the setting right. 0 0.9 seconds. can tell the sky is starting to darken there. 0 0.4, and there's 400 milliseconds in other words, and 200 milliseconds. Looks like that uh, M74, Messier 74 was to have set at 8.04, and M77 was to have set at 8.13, and it's 8.12. So we might miss these first two, right, guys? Sorry about that. We've also got uh, 12 P. Pons Brooks. That's going to set at 9.19. So we're hoping to catch that in honor of Messier again. There's 50 milliseconds. Oh, okay, now we're getting in the range, and there's Sirius right there. So 40 milliseconds. Yeah. So we're kind of in the right ballpark for pointing, aren't we? We just randomly have the, the scope, uh, you know, pointing at things, and there's, there's Sirius, Sirius, so that's good. 30 milliseconds. All right, well, we're going to have to wait till it gets just a shade darker anyway. So what happened was um, Delisle had great hopes for his young protege. And so Messier began searching for Halley's Comet at mid-1757. And he searched for it all the way until January 21st, 1759. So the guy searched for it for, what is that, two and a half years. He writes about the day he found it. He says, the whole day was very fine and without clouds. In the evening, I went over to the sky with the telescope, keeping the limits of the two ovals drawn by his boss on the celestial chart with his guide. Six o'clock, I discovered a faint glow resembling that of a comet. Uh, and unfortunately, there was another guy, Johann George Palich, a German farmer and amateur who lived near Dresden, and he had sighted it about a month earlier. So Messier wasn't the first. But uh, Palich's find didn't reach Paris till several months later. So Messier didn't know he'd been scooped. This is a picture of Messier, by the way. Don't you guys think we should have all done our hair like that in honor of tonight? I think we should have. Uh, you guys were talking about the eclipse over here. We're going to try to stream the eclipse live. Uh, it's about maybe an hour away from us, the path of totality. Well, that's probably close enough, so let's go ahead over to M74 and just see. Let's go to M70. Oh, rats, it's not letting us go because it thinks it's too low. I wish it wouldn't do that to us. It, it doesn't even show it as being eligible because it says it has already set. That's a bummer, isn't it? So why don't we go to the vicinity of Pond's Brooks, 12P Pond's Brooks then. Let's slew over to that. So anyway, Messier, he, um, 
by 1760, you see, by... Uh, He kept on, he was just hooked on comets now, but every time he'd try to find a new one, he called them comet masqueraders would get in his way, objects that were largely unknown and uncharted. There weren't any good star charts back then. August 28, 1758, he was tracking a comet and came across a patch that was fuzzy. He thought he found a new comet, but it didn't move, so he realized he'd been fooled, and he... He considered it the sky's version of a practical joke. He began to build a catalog of what he called embarrassing objects. And the first one he found, that one was, the one I'm referring to is Crab Nebula, and he called it Messier 1. It's the first one he found, huh? By 1765, he compiled 41 of those. So imagine being the first guy to compile all these objects. It's pretty wild, isn't it? Let's go over to our sky view for a second and adjust that uh, adjust that exposure now. Let's go up to like one second or two seconds maybe. Mm -hmm. Three seconds. Okay, this is looking better. So that's the uh, the sky view. Three seconds at a gain of three hundred. How about that? It's odd, isn't it? It's like it's not at all brightening up. Weird, isn't it? Let's go over to the um, plenty bright on the 2600, though. So this is the vicinity of Pons Brooks. Right here, that's where 12P Pons Brooks should be. Um, Seventeen or eighteen of those first forty-one were Messier's discoveries, and he acknowledged the other people who had discovered the rest, of course, dutifully. So, before he submitted that list for publication, he decided to round it off for a few other objects, and we have the copy of his first submission for publication. Uh, that's, of course, handwritten, copious notes. I think he trained as a map maker, so pretty accurate for the most part, as accuracy would go. He did uh, M42, 43, 44, 45, and he presented those 45 to the Academy of Sciences in Paris, and it appeared in the Academy's memoirs for that year. Uh, still having trouble, huh, Gerard, on our stream. Uh, let's see. So then, by 1780, that list had grown to 68 objects, most of which Messier himself found. His young protege, Pierre Michin, discovered 32 objects between 1780 and 81, and they published it again in the French almanac, Gonnaissant des Temps, so like knowing the times, maybe. April 13, 1781, Messier was up to 100th object, and he included three more quickly. He didn't have the time to check them, so he just included them, and that was 103 objects. And then a French popularizer of astronomy, Camille Flammarion, 
found notes about an additional object in his personal, in Messier's personal notes that was turned in as Messier 104, then after Messier's, Messier finished observing. And then in 1947, Canadian astronomer Helen Sawyer Hogg proposed adding uh, four more objects that were in, that were discovered by Machin. And he had turned them into Messier. And then uh, Owen, Owen Gingrich, an astronomical historian at Harvard, recommended a couple of more because they were mentioned in his catalog in the notes. So that became M108-109. And then Kenneth Glenn Jones in 1966 found an engraving where Messier noted 110 in a note about Andromeda galaxy. And so that became the final list. So keep in mind, this was the first such list of any kind of, uh, you know, anything resembling an astronomy catalog. So um, it became like history. It was the first time there had been a list of astronomical objects. And tonight, what we do is we try to see as many objects as we can from his catalog of 110 to sort of celebrate that initial set of discoveries. Uh, remember, these were objects that got in his way when he was searching for comets. So it's like a list of not comets, you know, embarrassing objects that distracted him. But it became a list of some of the greatest deep sky objects that were being discovered at the time. So all of us, as we start out in astronomy, I bet, pretty much all of us, wet our teeth on most of these Messier objects. And maybe we go on and do the Caldwell list and the Herschel 400 and, you know, a thousand and one celestial objects to see before you die, all those kinds of different lists. Uh, O'Meara, Stephen o James O'Meara's book of hidden treasures or the secret deep. You know, we, we go to other lists as time goes on, which are objects that are more exotic and more difficult. But it's kind of fun once a year to come back to the Messier list, and they are the biggest, you know. Not the biggest, but most of them are pretty good, pretty good size. So let me just uh, check back with the, with the group here, Stan and others. We've got about a dozen people monitoring now. Are you guys able to hear the stream? It looks like, Gerard, you said you were having trouble. But are others able to hear this? I see that uh, Stan's mentioning about how you can go to the grave. Uh, and I, I've seen that in several YouTube videos, people that have scouted out where the grave is. Anybody else able to hear the stream, or is it up and down? Okay, so this is the spot where we'll hope to find uh, 12 P. Pons Brooks Comet when it does show up. Let's go up to 0.5 seconds. Still too bright. Okay, Gerard says it's fine now. Larry, good to have you here. You're packing up to go to the eclipse area. Where are you driving to, Larry? Stan says eclipse is good. Whew, that's a relief. 0.2 seconds. I don't understand when you... Stop this down, and then it it fools me and thinks that it's so. Here's 80 milliseconds. Oh, okay. So now we're down into the into the horizon light. So the comet doesn't set till 9:19, but it's 8:25. We have several objects that set around. 9 o'clock. We have four different objects that set. Let me show you that list. We have, uh, there on that list, you can see, if you look in the far left, it's kind of a sequence number. And we've already missed objects 
that got sequenced at zero and one. That's M74 and M77. And then I was going to try to sneak in Pons Brooks here in our sequence as number two. So we had M74 as object zero, and then M77 as object one. So we missed those two already. Then we've got Pons Brooks, which is going to set this column over here. I don't know if you can see that cursor movement. Probably can't. Is uh, the set column over here, about uh, three columns to the right of the long name. Pons Brooks sets at 919. But then we have objects. There, I'll put my cursor on it. M33 and all of the Andromeda stuff. All those set around 8.49 p.m., which is just 22 minutes from now. So we have a strong horizon light here. Well, let's go ahead over to the Andromeda Galaxy, why don't we? Going to Owensboro. Good. All right. Well, good luck there, Larry. I better to be crowded in, in Owensboro. Okay. Still nothing but. Nothing but daylight at M33. So we've got another uh, 20 minutes. This is uh, triangulum. We're pointing in the direction of triangulum here. But I'm not seeing anything there. down to uh, to be able to see something intelligible it's about 50 milliseconds at 100 gain so we'll just keep monitoring until that horizon light continues to fade so you think the uh, interstates will be blocked up Larry yikes <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid you're right, Jared. If we'd gotten in in March, I think we would have done better on these twilight objects. But, boy, a month really hurts us, I think, to catch these fast-setting objects early on in the list. Regardless of daylight savings time. Because, you know, we're, we're setting our, our start time not by daylight savings time, but by the sky. So... So I hope you realize I'm not paying any attention to what the clock says, but rather just trying to do what the sky says. And it's just because we're a month later. You know, we tried, uh, we did a dry run warm up like a test to just get ready for things. And then we, uh, we tried on two other nights. Some of you guys were with us, I know. And neither of those two nights worked because of the weather. I think one night we got, we got the first four hours or so, didn't we? Now it's starting to darken some. We're up to, that's 80 milliseconds, just so that you can have a, a frame of reference. And remember, we should be pointed at Triangulum Galaxy. This is a spiral galaxy about 2.7 million light years away. And it should be the third, it's the third largest member of the local group behind Milky Way and Andromeda. It's the smallest spiral of the local group. So it's Messier 101. 
I'm sorry, Messier, Messier 33, what I, what I say here in my notes is that this object is called the Triangulum Galaxy, but also Simbad calls M101 the Triangulum. That's confusing to me. Some people call M33 a pinwheel galaxy, and of course, either way, it's also called NGC 598. I see I've got pinwheel galaxy in here twice, so I'm going to go ahead while I'm here and erase, and triangulum is in there, and pinwheel, just erase those, because they're duplicated for some reason there. So the triangulum is supposed to set around 858. Nothing here yet. 90 milliseconds is a very short. I don't know if we tried to stack something, if we'd see something, but see, you need a star to align with. We can't even, there is no star here yet. We are up to 100 milliseconds now, so that's a good sign. You can see that it's getting darker out there. 200 milliseconds. Still looks pretty bright there, doesn't it? George singing, Hello darkness, my old friend. So anyway, uh, I guess... Uh, There were a couple of mistakes in Messier's list, and we'll see those tonight if we get started observing. We'll find a couple that had some mistakes. Like, for instance, uh, Messier 91, he seems to have been off on his charting. Messier 102, he just took the word of the other observer and didn't verify it. Stuff, and then Messi suffered a stroke in 1815 that left him partially paralyzed and he died two years later at 87. Uh, he discovered, I think I read somewhere, I don't see it here in, I don't see it here in uh, O'Meara's, you know, biography of him, but I think I read that he discovered seven comets on his own and then with, with a friend, he discovered 13 more. So he had a part in 20 comets, which is really amazing for a person of any age, of any era. Uh, so we kind of salute him, don't we, in this, in this act tonight of going through this hunt. Now we're up to 0.3 seconds, 300 milliseconds. And you can just look outside now. If we weren't, if we weren't trying to look right over in the west, we could see more, you know, but we're trying to catch these objects in the west. It's 8.34. I wonder if we should sneak over to the Andromeda galaxy just because it sets a little earlier, about 10 minutes earlier. And again, you can see that in our in our worksheet here in Astro Planner. It's the software used to target and also to observe. So you can see we're looking pretty low down on the horizon. This is just 13 degrees altitude right now. Skycam. And then here's our uh, 2600. We're going to need to see stars in order to start stacking. But to do a messy marathon, we've got to catch these before they set. And it's just one of the problems of doing an April-based marathon. A March, March-based marathon is much easier. You're right, sunrise is earlier as well. Gerard says, thanks to the dozen or so who are on, if you've not identified yet who you are and where you're observing from, it'd be great if you'd check in there. This is being uh, 
recorded. So if you're watching this as recorded version, we're sorry that during this first hour, all we've done is tell about Messier's life. We use three different books for source material on Messier Marathon. They are Stephen James O'Meara's book, The Messy Objects. Uh, then you've got uh, Don Macholt's book, Messy a Marathon. Of course, Don being one of the folks who's credited with first doing the marathon, one of four different parties. And then Harvard Pennington, his field guide, Messy a Marathon. Uh, he calls it year round because he says you don't have to just do it in the spring. You can do a Messy a Marathon in any month. And that's true. It's just that some of them are going to be aligned so much with the sun that they'll be like tonight. These are aligned kind of with the sun and these early objects, and we're not able to really see them because of that. So Gerard says, excellent books. And then we've also just uh, used online sources to, to prepare for tonight as well. Uh, we're here for the whole night. We've got our uh, sleeping bag and a, and a pad here. We hope to get caught up, if we can get caught up, so that by maybe, uh, I don't know, 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., we can catch a two-hour nap. But otherwise, we'll be here, and we hope you can, you can join us for a part of this or all of it. We're up to uh, above a dozen people now. Larry is in central Illinois. Uh, let's see. I don't see any others. The rest of you are kind of shy. So, waiting for some stars to peek out here. <clears throat> While we do that, we could say something about getting started in astronomy. You know, most of the Messier objects you can pick out with a good pair of binoculars. Um, Maybe if you had, say, something like 10 by 50s, the 10 is the power, kind of, I guess, and the 50 is the aperture. And by, by using a larger aperture, say, 10 by 50 instead of 7 by 35, you know. So the 35 is a little bit smaller aperture lens. The 50 lets in a little more light. The binoculars become a little more helpful. But if you get above 50, uh, they start getting to be harder and harder to hold steady. So I think 10 by 50 is that sweet spot. And I think maybe 75% or more of the Messier list you could do with binoculars. And that would be a very respectable, a very respectable uh, sum. In fact, I was looking tonight at the Messier uh, records page. It's uh, kept by some volunteers at a website called Messier.seds, S-E-D-S, like Sierra, Echo, Delta, Sierra. Messier.seds.org. And you can see here, 2021 was the first year that I got started with a group of others from Cloudy Nights. And there were probably, uh, I don't know, eight of us maybe that stuck with each other that whole night. And we were able to get, by God's grace, all 110 objects that night. And it was just because we were doing it as a team. And then in 2022, um, much, many of the same team cooperated. We missed M30 that year. That was 2022. And then last year, a guy from here in Emerald Hill Skies, Stu and I, did it in March, and uh, we were able to once again hit 109. Uh, again, I think a March marathon is easier. So, so far in 2024, it looks like nobody's, nobody's down yet for accomplishments, but there are four that are scheduled. So, um, that's basically the way it's uh, recorded, and if you stick with us throughout the whole night, we will, yeah, there's Frank. He was in that first year. Uh, Frank says, that was a great year, Doug. <laughs> That's great, Frank. Glad you're here. 
you were part of that team. It was. In fact, you were kind of the key guy. You stayed at it all night, and I, I was a learner. I was an apprentice with you. Tom, good to have you from the Chesapeake Bay. Looking forward to the Virgo Galaxies. Bless your heart. Or it's Tim. Sorry, Tim. I have to adjust my spectacles. Tim Pileski, maybe. Um, there were some severe weather, but I, I don't guess it, it hurt us any here that we know of. Okay, still waiting for this to darken some. Let's go to 0.7 seconds. You need to see some stars in order to um, even start stacking, see? These objects are supposed to set in just 10 minutes. Bummer, huh? Well, Frank, uh, while you're on there, are you still observing? And if I remember right, you had a... See, I'm trying to remember. You had converted one of your, like a C8 kind of scope, you had converted it to uh, the low, you know, being able to make it a F2... Why is it I can never remember the name of that, Frank? You have to remind me every time. You had converted it with that, with that front-mounted camera setup. Can't remember what exactly is your rig. You're still observing as much as possible. Good. Yeah, Frank, you were you were really the the key guy there in 21 when we got all 110. You have three rigs, so maybe uh, tell us what those are while we're waiting for something to show up in the screen here. 0.8 seconds. One second. This is all at 100. Wonder if I go it. No, I don't think it'll make any difference. We're, we're seeing as much as there is to see here, I believe. But let's go ahead and put the gain on 200. Yeah, see, it's just... Just not quite dark enough out there yet in the western horizon sky. That's the problem. So you have an 8-inch SCT with Hyperstar. That's what I can never remember. And the Hyperstar brings it down to F2, if I remember right. And Frank's up in uh, upstate New York, like someplace like Schenectady or someplace like that, I think. And a Williams Optics FLT-91 refractor. Boy, I bet that's a beautiful instrument. Williams Optics. Everything I see from Williams Optics is just, like, machined so well. It's such craftsmanship. And it's just... I mean, it's just so... If it's aluminum, it's just polished off and... Sealed so well. Yeah, precisely right. He says Schenectady. It's a it's a city I can pronounce, but I think I would would have to practice its spelling. S C H is a is an S K in this case. So if you're just joining us here, this is a, an attempt to observe as many of the Messier objects as we can. We already know that we've missed. Uh, Messier 74 and 77, they've already set. We're just five minutes away from the set of, um, <clears throat> I believe, the Andromeda Galaxy. We are now at one second and a gain of 300 here. So as you can see, that's still just because the sun is down there in the west. So rest assured, the telescope is pointing where the Andromeda galaxy can be seen, but there's just so much competing sunlight that... Now look, there's the first glimmer of something. And for all we know, that might be the core of the Andromeda galaxy. So this gives me hope. Let's drop that down to 0.8 seconds and push the gain up to like 300. 
<clears throat> Boy, it's still so bright. It, if you're new to telescopes and you're just stopping by, like in the recording or whatever, uh, tuning up the camera on the telescope, uh, this one, tuning up that camera is pretty much like using a camera like a 35 millimeter camera in that you can adjust the shutter speed and also something called the gain, which would be like the, the uh, you know, in a, in a regular camera we, we have something similar, the, the, the speed of the, of the exposure. And we can adjust both on this camera, but it's a bit of a teeter-totter. You, you get the uh, shutter speed too long and you're overexposing the, in this case it's a sensor, not film, but Frank's headed up to Plattsburgh for the eclipse. Um, Gerard saying originally from Buffalo, Niagara Falls area himself. I don't know what the clouds will be like in this area where we are, but um, we're going to try to go up to a town, Seymour, Indiana, and I have a feeling it's going to be super crowded. They're doing an eclipse, an eclipse um, festival all day. So if you're just tuning in, if you're just tuning in and wanting to see the Messier, the Messier uh, catalog, that's, that's what we're doing. We're kind of waiting for the sky to get dark enough to be able to pick up what we hope will be the Andromeda Galaxy. It's scheduled to set in just really in, in another minute or two, sadly. So now we'll be, unfortunately, in the treetops when we do see it. And my, my horizon is a custom horizon, I think. Let me see if, um, if I say, let's make it, um, let's put it on low horizon. And what I mean by that is, it means that um, it's going to let us look down at the trees. So now, using the low horizon, so now I'm talking about instead of my custom horizon I've made, we're using the actual horizon. And that says that actually the Andromeda Galaxy is going to set at 10.25 p.m. I'll see this M77. Let's go over to M74 again. Let's just slew over there real quick with this, um, what, I, what I'm calling the low horizon. So there you can see some treetops. And now you can see definitely we're into some kind of the side of the observatory or something. <laughs> so let's go to M77. Now you can see some, There are some treetops there we're into. So my custom horizon was correct. But let's use this low horizon just to give us the benefit of the doubt. Now let's go back to where M33 should be. And again, my... Let's see. My custom horizon said M33 would be into treetops. And sure enough, look at all those treetops. Oh, but look, there's a, a star there. So at least, even though we're in the treetops, here's another star. We're finally starting to see at least some stars. And there's something right in the middle. It's a double star. How about that? Let's go over to, um, I'm using this uh, EAA a control panel that our friend Pete over on the Isle of Wight. Pete, if you're if you're watching, thank you for these 
custom panels and stuff. Uh, he has made a control panel so that if we have M33 highlighted and we say Stellarium Sync, Selected. it automatically selects it in Stellarium, which I think is a cool deal. Oh yeah, look, there are two stars right in the middle of Triangulum Galaxy. So now let's go back to our live view and look at those two stars there. So you can see we're not focused yet. We haven't had enough stars to focus. But those two stars are the center of M33. Now it's up to you guys. Can we can we stack this? Will sharp cap allow us to stack this? That's the question. Wow, look down here. One, two, three, four, five, six stars in a in a a shape of some kind. Oh, that's because it's not stacking correctly. <laughs> All right, well, sadly, unless we could see it live, I doubt we're gonna be able to count this. That's a, a gain of 250. Let's sneak it up to a gain of 300. See, it doesn't help matters that we weren't able to focus yet. Depends on your definition of the object. Again, looking at Stellarium, those two stars are what we're seeing. If we count this as the core, even though it's there in the treetops, unfocused, I wonder if we can sort of count that. I'm going to make an observation here. I'm going to say we could only catch the core of M33 along with its other bright star, and that would be this star here, which is Hipparchus 7269. Hipparchus 7269A. In the treetops. So in uh, Messier Marathon, you know, you, you... Observation logged. You count uh, just about whatever you can count. Let's go over to Andromeda now. And again, um, we're very close to the horizon, about 10 degrees, so. But look right there, I wonder if we can. Ah, uh, yeah, I think we ought to be able to focus now. So let's turn off this camera quickly and let's go over to. Um, did I leave Nina up? Hmm. I don't think I did. Let's go over to Nina and see if there's enough there to focus real quick. Tiffany, welcome. Yeah, we got to be flexible. You're right. <laughs> Bless your heart, Tiffany. You're an encourager. Okay, so what we do is we focus in Nina, because it's so automated. And uh, I have kind of a tradition. I bring a chocolate chip cookie, and I, I eat a chocolate chip cookie during the automated focus routine. So if you guys have a, some kind of cookie nearby, I encourage you to, 
to do that. I should start some uh, music or something so you don't hear me um, munch, huh? So I ought to start some music, but I'm at least going to mute the mic here. Tiffany says, long night ahead. That's right. I stopped running music because I thought, well, that's one thing we can do without to get a few more MIPS to give you guys a good stream. So I stopped doing music for the time being. But I'm sure these quiet times are not as entertaining because we're not playing music now. So if this is your first time on the channel, we usually do the focus ahead of time. But tonight uh, it was sort of reverse order because we were trying to catch whatever we could see uh, as the sun was setting. And you probably noticed we weren't able to see a whole lot. But now we'll get a good focus. And we really have to refocus Every time the temperature changes by, say, two degrees, it's enough to change the optics and throw things off a little bit. So there will come a time in a couple of hours, you'll look and you'll say, boy, that telescope doesn't look very good. And what it is is that the focus shifts off. And if you haven't been on the channel for a while, the way Nina's um, autofocus routine works is it snaps a picture and in fact, a couple of pictures, and then it throws the focus in one direction or the other and snaps another one. And then it throws the focus in one direction or another and snaps another one. It keeps going in the same direction, of course. If, if you're headed in a direction of proper focus, then the star point, you can imagine, because the definition of focus is the star becomes more like a point. And if you're headed out of the ideal focus zone, then the star becomes fuzzier. And a fuzzier star is more like a donut or a, a wider a wider point, a wider disk. It becomes disk-like or donut-like. And that concept is referred to sometimes, I think, as half flux radius or something. Uh, but basically, it's, a, it's almost a photometry. It's almost measuring the amount of light or illumination. And what you're seeing here on the chart in front of you is a graph plot of the amount of illumination that was visible with each setting of the motor focuser that's changing the focus of the, the telescope. Now, if you see a little bit of fluctuation in the points, that's because of things like atmospheric disturbances, twinkling of the star, so to speak. It can be caused by, I mean, everything imaginable. Uh, 
wind that shakes something or even a jet or something that flies by. So generally what the subroutine does, the plugin in Nina, is it's looking for this red hyperbola here. And it's kind of trying to plot a hyperboline, hyperbolic line, a parabola, between all those fluctuations. And the way I have it set up is it's actually taking two pictures at each spot. And that way you kind of get almost an average of the two. Then once it uh, finds a setting that it thinks creates the smallest point, then at that point it <clears throat> remembers where, <clears throat> where it was at that smallest point and it uh, sets the focuser back at that smallest point. Okay, so still quite a lot of You know, I think our treetops got in the way of that focus, sadly. But let's, uh, let's take advantage of whatever we can see here. We're going to... Selected. Now let's go over to Stellarium. So we should see two cores fairly close and one a little bit farther. So we're going to say this is the core of Andromeda, and that's M32 we're going to guess. I don't think it'll let us stack this because of all that interference. We can always try. Let's turn off our display histogram so that's not a factor. Boy, we're just really down in the treetops, huh? So we're going to say that, um, let's look here, there is a brighter core and here are two stars. And then here is an outlier. Look how there are almost three stars there. And then here's an outlier. Now let's go back to Stellarium. Okay, so there's our brighter store. St there's our brighter core, and here are three outlying stars. Brighter core and three outlying stars. Yeah. And then, so 110 and 32 are the closest, and then this star is Hipparchus 3494. So we're going to say that that is the core of Messier 31, the Andromeda Galaxy. That is M32, or yeah, M32 here. Wow. Trying to see galaxies through the treetops, huh? We don't really get issues with Frost or Dew, thankfully. We have a Dew Chaser on the scope and a Dew Guard. Yeah, Gerard, we knew that uh, this would not be astronomical darkness, but with the Messier Marathon, you kind of just have to cheat a little bit. Now, there's an outlying there and an outlying there. So we should have one, two, three, four, five, especially three stars. Three close, two fairly close, and then two outlying. So three close, here are the outliers, down in those treetops. 
So we're just going to say here, sadly, we could only see the core, the cores of M31, M32, and M110. We were looking through lots of treetops. Now with Pete's um, observations for three objects logged, e EAA control panel, the interesting thing is um, it will show observations for all of those objects simultaneously. Try this live stack one more time. Where are our, oh, here they are. That's crazy. Yeah, not enough stars to be able to guide the frames and stack them successfully. So all those consecutive dots that you see are where we're just not able to stack correctly. Let's go up to maybe a um, 10 second frames here. Overexposed. Five second frames, perhaps. I wonder if we were to try to plate solve this. If at all, hey, it did, it did plate solve. So many trees. <laughs> sometimes, what I'm waiting on is, sometimes an object will float down to a more of an opening in the treetops. And you know, you'll get past a, um, a darker branch So we know now that we're plate solved, so that's in our favor. Maybe there's a little more opening down here. I 
I have good sharp focus now too. Not enough. I wonder if this core here is our M31 core. Hoping that when it sneaks down in this area, we'll be able to see more of the fuzziness of the disc a little bit. It's about eight, eight degrees above the horizon now. Yeah, see, you can almost see now it's on an angle like this. And you can start to see a little bit more of the structure. Well, off we go, right, to M79. We have about 17 on the live stream. Thanks to you guys who, who have um, checked in. Ah, this is so nice, so much nicer, real sky. Okay, so now we can do a regular uh, plate saw first. This is M79. It's a globular cluster in Lepus. And this was discovered by Pierre Machin in 1780. It's about 42,000 light years away. And It's not probably native to the Milky Way. It was probably um, from the Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy. But everybody's debating that still. It might be part of what they call the Gaia Sausage, and it's being disrupted by the galactic tide. So it has a long tidal tail. Look at this tail here. See how it's starting to be disrupted. We could make out the tidal tail. Observation log. Let's go to M52. It's called the Scorpion NGC. 7654, and it's an open cluster in the constellation of Cassiopeia, discovered by Charles Messier in 1774. The brightness of this cluster is influenced by a lot of dust and dark matter that's between us and the southern half of the cluster. So it kind of means that the cluster itself gets blotted out somewhat by that effect, sadly. However, uh, sometimes situations like that almost work to our benefit because we can study then the dark matter that's 
uh, in the way, or dust, either one, that's in the way. Some of these objects are so, so low on the horizon that um, they're being influenced by the by the low horizon. We're having to look through, uh, let's see, I don't know if I have the number of atmospheres on here, but like we're having to look through three layers of atmosphere here. This is called the Scorpion, or alternatively, Cassiopeia Salt and Pepper, or sometimes just October Salt and Pepper. We're just at 15 degrees above the horizon here. Right, open cluster, right, Chard? Really does look a little bit like salt and pepper, doesn't it? It really does look like salt and pepper. Observation log. M103 is next. It's at 25 degrees, which means we can start breathing just a little bit. We're out of the teens, in other words. Those first uh, you know, slew of objects that are down in the, so low in the horizon that they're in the teens. That's kind of sad, isn't it? Because we, we don't really get to see a, uh, a good version of them. So really, we have to come back to them on another night. Now that we're up around uh, 25 degrees, it means that we can see a little bit better view here. And now what we'll do also since we're kind of caught up into the into the twenty somethings, we'll go back and see if we can pick up twelve p Ponds Brooks again. It's at eleven degrees. I don't know if it's down in the treetops yet, but we'll see. So that's uh, M one hundred three. It's an open cluster, a few hundred, mainly faint stars. Discovered in seventeen eighty one by Messier's friend Pierre Michin. It's about uh, fifteen light years away. It's got. 40 member stars that are certain, and then some foreground stars that are not members of the cluster. Might have 172 stars, and uh, could be around 22 million years old. Observation log. Okay, let's see if we can slip over to Ponds Brooks now. This is uh, the comet that perhaps you've been hearing about. <laughs> Gerard says, we be on a roll. Stan's wanting us to refocus, but as you can see, part of that focusing issue was the low horizon. I don't think it will hurt us to refocus if we get a chance, but, but I think we can get by here for a second. See if we can, yeah, this comma is already down in the trees as well, sadly. I don't know if we have enough to be able to do a plate solve or not. We did. Oh, there's the comet. Nice. So we're at about... Uh, 50% of our optical zoom. But you can see why they call it the, um, what, the Devil Comet? Because it's, it's got more of a, a fuzzy tail on it than what we're used to seeing, doesn't it? Look how a comet typically has a brighter core like that. And then there'll be a lot of greens here. And I've checked on these greens before to see what those are. A lot of them are different kinds of gases, not just oxygen. They can be all kinds of gases, but definitely non-stellar gases that are venting out of the comet. Could see the wide 
coma and the broad tail extremely bright caught it just before it hit the treetops. Of course by changing observation the, logged. By changing the um, observation the, the exposure we can see different parts of the comet. So if we go to five seconds we might see more of this broad tail here. And then by coming down to three second exposures we can get that coma around the head a little bit more defined with green there, but we lose the tail. So if we had uh, more time uh, we could stack these and maybe get a little bit better view of the tail, but at least now you can say that you saw the um, can saw you can you can say that you saw 12p um, pond books. All right, that really isn't one of the Messier objects, but it's a tribute to Charles Messier because he cared about comets most. How about that? Okay, off we go to M76 then. And M76 is called the Little Dumbbell Nebula. Some people call it the Apple Core Nebula. Some people call it the Barbell Nebula. And um, others have called it the Cork Nebula. It's also known as NGC 650. NGC 650. You might notice the first thing we do when we get to a new spot is we plate solve. What that means is we, yeah, I love the greenish blue teal color as well, Gerard. Uh, plate solving is uh, basically comparing our file um, version of the sky with the version that the camera is seeing and then aligning the two. So in other words, it makes sure that we're pointing right at the object. And that's why we get these uh, quick, quick finds. We're now at 21 degrees above the horizon. And you can see with just a four second exposure without stacking, you can already begin to see that there is something there. And honestly, this is probably a pretty good representation of what you might see just observing through your telescope without using EAA. You would see this grayish fuzzy blotch there. And the size on this is 4.8 arc minutes, so it would look very small like this in your typical telescope. So what we'll do now is live stack this just for three minutes and clear that. And we'll try these four second exposures to see what that looks like. Uh, we typically do a lot longer exposures than that, but because it's messy a marathon night, let's see if we can rush these and use short exposures. I'm going to check our alignment here. Ah, yes. Yeah, it's, it's set on the wrong kind of alignment. So we're going to clear that and start again. There we go. It has a sticky memory. And if you've been aligning on a comet, it, it remembers. Okay, so now in this histogram, let's tune this up a little bit. What we do is the an, an auto live stretch, and then we do an auto color stretch, and then we manually tune it up afterward. You can see that it's it's picked a little bit much on the reds for me, but it is just a 
question of taste, isn't it? As to what There we go. So that's uh, just one minute of stacking. You can already tell that there is a lot of red in the poles, and that's all that hydrogen alpha being lit up like neon lights. And it's parallel to the gravitational pull of a north and south pole of this object. And this is referred to as a planetary nebula, even though the word planet doesn't really apply. But in the early days, astronomers looked at it and thought it had more of a disk shape. They didn't have as quite as uh, accurate of telescopes, so it looked more like a disk to them. So they just called it a planetary nebula, means, meaning it's a disk-shaped cloud. Nebula meaning cloud. And now we know it's a star that was basically nearing the end of its life. It jettisons out when it's no longer able to work hard enough to be able to power like it always had. It jettisons off its outer, outer layers. And those outer layers fly out into the interstellar space. And then the inner star that's left now has enough gravitational pull on its furnace to at least become a white dwarf. And it starts lighting up. And you might call it like neon lighting up those red poles. If we get all of the colors done well, then sometimes you can see a little bit of green in there. And that's, a, of course, more gases that are maybe more like oxygen. Can you see these little outer hints that there are some earlobes out here, see? And that's uh, another uh, shell of gas that was jettisoned out, maybe at a different time. So that's three minutes. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for tonight. But we'll come back to this, obviously, in other, in other live streams in the future. So now let's just go to Next target, I guess we'll do uh, next target without plate solving. So what we'll call it. So we'll say here in the little dumbbell that we could we could easily see the north south poles and could see hints of the east-west poles. Of course, the word pole being put in a quotation because they're, they're kind of poles, but they're kind of not. Observation logged. Uh, this next object is M34. And M34 is called sometimes the spiral cluster. It's NGC 1039. And it's a large, uh, relatively open cluster in the constellation Perseus. And it was discovered by Giovanni Bautista Hodierna before 1654. It has about 400 stars in it and spans about 35 arc minutes. So it's about seven and a half light years wide. Uh, actually, that's the radius, so it would be 15. I'm going to put here a, a diameter of 15, a diameter of 15 light years. And at least 19 members of this cluster are white dwarfs.
had a nice dark sky tonight. There's no moonlight at all. So that's helping us. Look how um, kind of wide out this is. And you, you can see why they called it spiral cluster, because look how it's kind of got it's got some patterns in it, doesn't it? It's sort of like look, there's a sort of a pattern here and a pattern here and a pattern here. Kind of a cool a cool cluster, huh? Gerard says it's great clarity and lots of good definition. And also he says snack time. <laughs> and Tiffany says stunning object. That's about the um, that's about the little dumbbell. And Gerard said couldn't have picked a better night. Well, except this is our third pick. <laughs> but you're right. We're thankful to the Lord that finally the clouds cleared, right? So we'll do here. Um, This cluster almost looks like a multi-petaled flower to us. Very open. Now, of Observation course, log. of course, um, being able to queue these up in Stellarium Selected. really helps us. It helps us to queue them up in Stellarium because using Stellarium, we can see where the object is in relation to our to the rest of our sky. So look at Andromeda is down here in the treetops. Of course, this is actually our representation of our treetops. So Andromeda is down here, even on there. Uh, well, let me let me rephrase that. This is my photorealistic horizon. And what I do with it is I drop it down below the line uh, that represents the horizon. And that way we can see objects that are right in the treetops here. But you can see here are the treetops that we saw Andromeda in a while ago. This is the, the roll-off roof of the observatory. And we're, we're pointing in the northwesterly direction. So here's north. That's the meridian, which we, we keep a line like that to show the, the split between the east and the west sides of the sky, just because our, our mount is a, a kind of mount where the telescope has to flip around. Equatorial mount, it's called. And so that tells us when that flip is going to happen, keeping that zenith visible to us. So there's the north, there's the northwest, and the west. You can see that the telescope is right here, let me put the field of view here. That'll help us a little bit. There's the field of view of the telescope. You can see that spiral cluster is right there. Now let's go to the Pleiades, which is a familiar, a familiar um, object for many of us. You know that this is sometimes called the Seven Sisters. Selected. And the Pleiades is still in that general west-northwest part of the sky. So here we are, is west. Here is northwest. So we're only up uh, still just 24 degrees. But remember the Pleiades, it sort of looks like a little tiny dipper. See if that's the handle. Maybe that one, if you let that be the handle. So this is one of those objects that is actually more than one kind of stellar object. Look how you get a cluster, and also you get these, this dust that the cluster is flying through. So let's go to the live view. So we're pretty much on target, but we'll go ahead and do a plate saw because it just helps the mount stay in sync with the sky all the better. A little bit of adjustment there of about a third of a degree. So here's that handle, and here's the bowl of that little dipper that we saw. So this will be the spout of the little dipper. Now in order to see that um, 
nebulosity, we would have to uh, We would have to live stack some. So let's live stack just again for three minutes or so. Stan says the video is choppy. Sorry about that. It's funny because uh, let me get back to the right screen here. Here it says the stream is excellent. So I really can't tell why that video is choppy, I mean, you know how the internet is. There could be any number of interruptions between us. So we can't always blame the recipient, we can't always blame the source, and we can't always blame what's in between, but somewhere in those three factors, somewhere in those three factors, Dan, there are some uh, hiccups in the internet, right? So, sorry about that, and unfortunately that's just a part of live streaming. So here you can start to see already, after just 60 seconds, you can see some of that nebulosity forming up here. And each of these stars has a name. I think this one's called Mirope, Miropia, whatever, M. I-R-O-P-E, I think. And I like the, the looks of Mirop the best. It just seems like it's, um, it's sort of pretty in my eyes. I don't know, maybe, I don't know how yours are. And I, I've noticed the longer we live stack on this, the more um, that the, the more that the scope wants for this, nebulosity to turn bluish. And it, this is really a beautiful object. It, of course, you can see this easily with naked eye and with binoculars, it's just beautiful. But I don't know that you can ever see the nebulosity with just binoculars, or obviously not with naked eye, or even with binoculars. I think you really need to do some live stacking to see that. The nebulosity was beautiful even after just 60 seconds. Observation log. All right. That's uh, two minutes and 40 seconds. It's a beautiful image, uh, but let's, let's run on. And the next object is going to be M42. You guys know what that is. Somebody, uh, somebody tell us what M42 is. Frank says solid streaming up in Schenectady. Awesome. And Gerard uh, has a good signal. So, like I say, Stan, it's just hard to say. It can be in any one of those three locations, either in the sending, in the receiving, or somewhere in between. So what this sequence does that we're using, it automatically um, does a plate saw for us. And that's pretty handy. And it even starts uh, live stacking for us. So you can see it's bringing M42 to the middle. Right, Frank says Orion. And Gerard as well, Orion Nebula. So in this object, we can probably get M42 and M43 both. So really, I should link these. And Astro Planner, and what's it what's called? Associate the selected objects.
Now this, you know, object always amazes me. That's 20 seconds of frames there, but it's partly because it's so close. Uh, one of the reasons that this object is so beautiful is because it is just so giant and so close. I think we're looking at uh, something like 20 light years here away. 20 light years. And this is naked eye visible, has a magnitude of about four, which is like totally bright. You know, you could see this naked eye probably from a dark suburb easily. And it's the closest region of massive star formation that we can see. Probably the width that we're looking at here is maybe 24 light years across. And stop and think, it's just 20 light years away. So this is a huge part of the sky. This would be one entire degree wide. So that's crazy. Uh, the mass of this object would be something like uh, 2,000 times of the sun. And of course, this has been spotted clear back in literally biblical times. You see Bible references to the great, the great nebula in Orion, you know. Um, in the Orion Nebula, there is this inner cluster of about four stars that is referred to sometimes as the trapezium, <clears throat> just because it's kind of trapezoid shaped. And those have a diameter of about one and a half light year. And in a good exposure of the inner stars, you can see the cluster, but what we're exposing for here is the entire nebula. And that cluster is what's lighting up all this gas. Um, maybe in this entire structure and, and all, you would see maybe 2,800 stars, and that's all in a diameter of, of 20 light years. So this is huge, and it has such amazing detail. Of course, all of this is the M42 side, and then this part over here is what might be called the M43 side. So how about you guys uh, tell us, what do you think, um, what do you think this looks like to you? Maybe vote, vote over there. What do you think this looks like? And then I'll tell you what mine is. Vote fast though, because we're at the three minute mark already. It's just so hard to get away from this object, isn't it? Look at all that crazy hydrogen alpha just glowing. For reference, we're still not at 100% of the camera, uh, the optics of the camera. We're not using any digital zoom at all. This is, this is at 50% of the camera's optical view. So what do you think that looks like, guys? What's your vote? Look at all this detail here. And what's happening here is stars are being born. So these are, this is happening like right now, brand new stars. I'll tell you what I think it looks like every time I come here. I see this huge body of something like a giant goose or something. And this is the goose's, excuse me, the goose's head. And look at this little um, nebulosity here that kind of looks like it's a fire-breathing goose. So it's got its mouth open going, oh, you know, it's attacking something out here. It's a fire-breathing goose to me every time. Now, you can also see over here a, an object that's not on the Messier list, and we figured out the other night that this is a upside-down running guy. <laughs> that nebula has its own name. Selected. And it is Running Man Nebula, NGC 1977. So it doesn't have an M number. 
Now again, for orientation, this is right in the Sword of Orion, thus the Orion Nebula name. And this is more tonight in the western sky. So it's getting towards spring. Orion is starting to sink earlier. So it's between west and southwest. It's five minutes. We went over time on this object. But it is an incredible object, isn't it? It's just incredible. Tiffany sees the goose. Gerard likes the Trifid Nebula and the Lagoon Nebula, the Cat's Eye Nebula with a small scope. All right, let's grab a picture of this. This is just six minutes, but it's worth saving a picture of that. And incredible. Stars forming, fire-breathing goose. Tiffany saw it. Observations for two objects logged. All right. Welcome to the Messy Marathon. We have to leave, and we're headed to M78. M78. Tiffany says, I will never cease to be amazed by the heavens. Beautiful dark sky tonight. No moon at all, and when the moon does rise, it's only like a two degree slice of illumination. So it's, but it doesn't even rise until like 7 a.m. ish or whatever. Um, yeah, seven no, 6.42. So it is not going to be a factor. We could get some clouds around 6 a.m., maybe even as early as 5 a.m. So M78, NGC 2068, it's a reflection nebula in the constellation Orion, and it was discovered by Pierre Michin in 1780. It's the brightest diffuse reflection nebula of a group of nebulae that includes NGC 2064, 2067, and 2071. And this group belongs to what's sometimes called the Orion B molecular cloud complex. It's about 1,350 light years away from Earth, and it involves some stars of 10th and 11th magnitudes. And especially the 10th and 11th magnitude when in the middle are two of these type of stars we call B, like Bravo type stars. It's uh, HD 38563A and B, and they're responsible for lighting up the cloud of dust. Makes M78 visible, even from the suburbs of Paris where Pierre Machin was observing. So this is a much, much smaller nebula. This is at the camera's native mode. So you can see how comparatively tiny it is. And you can see I always thought that this one over here, I always think of it, it looks sort of like a ghost. And here are the two peering eyes. And then here's another patch of nebulosity. Here's some other nebulosity that we can already see. Selected. Over in Stellarium, again, thanks Pete for programming such a cool control panel. Just speeds up so much, Pete. I cannot tell you how much that little control panel speeds things up. Uh, so remember, we were down here in the sword. Well, now we're up here above the belt. So this will be by his belly, by Orion's belly. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I spun around uh, Stellarium. How do I get this? There we go. 
also this part. Oh, look, it's called Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula, M78. I'm going to put that in the, um, in the notes here because it's not. NGC 2068 Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula. I love Astro Planner because it just lets us make these notes. VDB 59 said 55U. We can just make these notes on the fly. And Astro Planner, it's the uh, targeting, the targeting software we're using here. It just makes it so much easier to make these notes on the fly. Whereas with other, uh, like Sky Tools 4, I'm so sorry, Greg. Uh, you, you can't add notes like that on the fly. And this is, to me, it's just so much friendlier. So now there's a part of our, our record. So this is actually the Messier object. But then this over here is NGC 2071. And then this is something else. That's NGC 2071. That's NGC 2067. And then that's the Casper the Friendly Ghost. So, uh, once again, let's figure out which is which. The two eyeballs one, the, the one I said it looks like a ghost, that's M78. So let's go back to the live view again. So this is M78. But look at all this nebulosity. That's not uh, your imagination. That's just all a bunch of dust that's being backlit by this by these stars this dust out here but that's what Pierre Machin saw we identified it as a ghost before seeing the Casper name in Stellarium. Observation log. He didn't have an 11 inch Rasa, for sure, Gerard. Gerard says, never get tired of viewing the night sky. You never know what you'll see. Tiffany is saying, Pete, bravo. <laughs> oh, that is so nice. Tiffany, to give Pete a, a bravo to cheer him on there. Uh, yeah, we would be able to see the flame in the horse head, but another night, Gerard, unfortunately. Ricky, good to have you on from Florida. Thanks for stopping by. Okay, so that's five minutes. We went over budget, but that's because we got carried away about the ghost, right? Step it up, Doug. Can't quite get so involved with each one on messy marathon night. Off to M41, the little beehive, and really, we probably don't need to stack this at all. This is a, an open cluster. There you see a nice view of the Rasa. See the weights are uh, weights up toward the west, and we know that because the camera is looking through the mount at the North Star. So you can pretty much tell the scope is pure east and the weights are west, and that's the way an equatorial mount you can kind of describe it. It's a really nice view of the way you've got that dew guard on the front, and then you can see that outrigger assembly that's up on top of the scope. You can see that real clearly in the live view here. See that outrigger up on top? It's fun, huh? All right, so M41 now. M41. Yeah, we definitely don't have to live stack this. You can see it already live there. It's called a little beehive, and I'm sure you can understand why, can't you? Because you can see all of those buzzing bees swirling around that. Yeah, 
Gerard says it's actually not so little. It uh, takes up 38 arc minutes. You're right, which since uh, there are 60 arc minutes to a degree, this is an entire half a degree. Now, what's a moon? What, what, what is a moon? Is it, uh, I'm trying to remember, is a moon 30 arc minutes? Oh my goodness, look at all those stars. Wow. That's crazy. Okay, so suddenly I'm glad we stacked this just a little bit because that is an incredibly rich part of the night sky, isn't it? My goodness. Zillions of stars. How can God know all of these by name? There's bound to be a metaphor here somewhere. Observation log. If he knows all of these by names, and these are just stars, then how much the more does he know you by name? How about that? Let's look at this just for Select one second it. in Stellarium and see how Stell yeah, Stellarium does a good job. I don't know, though. When you back off, you don't get the full feeling of all those stars. Do you notice how Canis Major really does look like a dog? I mean, it, it's one of the few constellations that really does look like a dog. You've got the legs and the body and then the head. And you notice it's right here by Orion because Canis Major is his hunting dog. And that's why they call Sirius the dog star. So anyway, this little beehive, which uh, Gerard said isn't actually so, so little, look at those stars. Excuse me, now let's go back to the live view. It's an open cluster, Canis Major, discovered by Giovanni Battista Moderna before 1654, perhaps known to Aristotle, around 325 BC. The cluster covers an area about the size of the full moon. So there's my answer. The full moon must be around... 30-ish arc minutes, because this is 38 arc minutes. It contains about 100 stars, including several red giants. The bright red-orange star near the center is Hipparchus 32406, right here. Right there in the middle. Hipparchus 32406. A giant star of spectral type K2, about 1,500 light years away, magnitude 6.9. So not quite visible to the naked eye, but it sure is pretty in this, in this cluster, isn't it? Now, I always get confused because I think, how can you tell the cluster from the background? The, the background is so rich. Look at all these little uh, trails. I mean, this looks like a, a whole ray of stars that's radiating out from this cluster. How do you know when the cluster starts and stops? It's so rich. And Gerard says, if they're young, you see lots of blues and yellows. Tiffany says, overwhelmingly beautiful. Mike, good to have you aboard from John Creek, Georgia. 400 miles south, beautiful clear night there too. Glad, glad to see you, Mike. Thanks for hopping on. All right, we're going to head now to the to M93, the butterfly cluster. Some people call it the Critter Cluster. M93. It's also known as NGC 2447. NGC 24... Actually, I should be using the M numbers here. M93. To wait till the mount settles because it, it's going to take its uh, plate solving picture and you want it to be fairly. Look at those pinpoint stars, they're just beautiful. I love this uh, hobby because you get to just back off sometimes and see the beauty of it all. Papillion, pa papillion, what is that, Tiffany? Selected. Papillon. This is M93. A butterfly cluster. 
Now, so what we did is, remember we were over on Orion's belt here. Then we went up near his belly. Then we went over to the dog star area and got to see something here. And then now we're here. So this is above the constellation Puppies. <laughs> However you say that. I think that's named from the deck of a ship, isn't it? The poop deck? I always think that's an odd name. I guess you can see why they named it after... They were a seafaring group. All these people dreaming up these names. Anyway, this is between South and Southwest. In the uh, photorealistic horizon, the night I took this picture, my truck was parked there. But tonight, my truck is over here under the canopy because I had to pull in some stuff that I'm going to use when I have my camp out here in a while, I hope. So uh, my truck is not there. So the photorealistic horizon is kind of deceptive tonight. Anyway, the butterfly cluster here, it's really rather beautiful, isn't it? M93, pretty packed out cluster. Let's go to the real view. This is the real live current view. And uh, let's see if we can tune this up a little bit, bring in a few more stars. Quite a bit of noise there so far because it's just 100 seconds. This is an open cluster in the modestly southern constellation Pupus, discovered by Charles Messier in 1781. It's five light years wide. And its age, apparent age to us, is 387 million years. Ciao, Piansam. You must be talking to somebody who speaks another language there, Tiffany. Trevor, good to see you. Good to have you aboard. Larry, good to have you back. Papillon of Farfalla, but oh, butterfly. Papillon and Farfalla. Well, there's something I don't know about. This must be a, a couple of butterflies from a story that you read, Tiffany. Anyway, um, this whole thing of age, I don't know if you've noticed us before, but we've said all of these ages are all apparent age. We don't know what age the universe really is, and this really came to light in the last month because... The James Webb Space Telescope made some discoveries of stars and globular clusters that shouldn't observation log shouldn't be as old as they look like they are and they don't they they still look young for their age. So I don't know if I said that correctly or not, but bottom line is now we're headed to M47 and M46 together. M47 dash M46. And we target this particular slew point as Tycho 05409 dash 2667 1. And the reason we do that is because we found a star right between M46 and M47 that lets us get both of them in the same frame. So it's two for one special, folks. And we do this about, I don't know, 10 times here in the Messier list that lets us uh, slew the telescope once for more than one object. And we, uh, after we arrange these slew points like this, we uploaded the file to the Astro Planner uh, user user file document area because we, we didn't see this done anywhere else, this idea of finding a slew point star that allows you to be able to see more than one thing on the same uh, frame if you have a telescope like the Ross 11 with the 2600 attached, which I think is a... I see it more and more. More and more observers have... they, they are pairing something like the Ross 11 with something like the 2600. It gives you a nice wide field of view, something like 2 degrees 10 minutes by 1 degree 27 minutes. And 
When you do that, for instance, here in this frame, you get both of these clusters. And look at the neat planetary nebula you get in this cluster. So I think uh, M46 is on top, if I'm not mistaken. Selected. I think this is M46 with the planetary nebula, and then this is M47. But let's go over to Stellarium to make sure. Yeah, M46 is the one with the planetary nebula in the cluster. So M46 here and M47 there. M46 is an open cluster in the slightly southern, still in the constellation Puppies, Pupus, Puppus, discovered by Charles Messier in 1771. About 500 stars, combined mass of 453 of our suns. And it's thought to be around 251 million years old in apparent age. Has a tremendous spatial extent. In other words, especially in infrared, it, it is giant in infrared, very, very tall, even though it's faint. And it could be that it is so tall and has this tail extending in the infrared because of a past interaction with another galaxy. Maybe the other uh, cluster in this field of view. And this planetary nebula, 2438, which is right here. Um, for context, this is just 100 degrees of the, 100 percent of the optical zoom. You know how a lot of times, gang, we have to use a digital zoom? But this is a pretty good size planetary nebula. I wonder if that might be the center star. It's hard to tell, isn't it? We're into the pixelation now, in the digital zoom. But going back out to the 100% of the optical zoom, it's still a good size, even with just the optical zoom. That appears to lie within the cluster near its northern edge, a faint, almost rainbow array of colored smudge at the top center of the image. It's, almost, it's most likely unrelated to the cluster, though, since it doesn't share the cluster's radial velocity. But it does make for a really good looking object superimposed on the cluster, huh? The We're already at three minutes, so we can't hang around here long. But if we did hang around here long, you get a little more nebulosity here. Let's see if we can see it in Stellarium. Uh, they don't show as much nebulosity either. Yeah, just a, a hint of nebulosity, see? Well, it's kind of hard to see unless you back off. Just a hint of nebulosity. Look how we had to zoom in on that star in order to find these so they would be in the same field of view. See how we can see in Stellarium with our, our simulated field of view. This is what we're looking at here in the live view with uh, SharpCap. SharpCap is what we're using for these images, by the way. It looks like almost a, a cluster there, doesn't it? But Stellarium doesn't have it, does it? Oop. Come to us, baby. Come to us, Stellarium. Nope. I don't think so. Oh, that's it. NGC 2423. So this is NGC 2423. Very interesting. And this is uh, NGC, this is Messier 47 down here. It's an open cluster with a mildly southern, oh, it's also in Pupus, discovered by Hodierna before 1654, and his then keynote work rediscovered it it was rediscovered by Messier in 1771. And Caroline Herschel didn't know that it had been discovered before, and she discovered it again. By the way, 
it looks like Messier messed up on this. He, he put a plus and he meant to put a minus. And until then, until somebody figured that out, nobody could figure out what Messier 47 was supposed to be. It wasn't until 1959, until the Canadian astronomer T.F. Morris found this possible switch. And sure enough, people realized that's what Messier did. He just, he just substituted a plus and a minus sign. It looks to be about 78 million years old, and the member stars have been measured down to red dwarfs at a parent magnitude of 19. There are around 500 members if you count all those. That's all M47 down here at the bottom. Dominated by some hot class B main sequence and giant stars, but a noticeable color contrast comes between the, the brightest reddish and the brightest whitish stars. We've been six minutes here, but we did see two objects, so I guess, and three if we count this non-messy object. Let's do a quick observation here. Thank you, Pete. Uh, you let us observe both objects at once. Saw the planetary and M46, beautiful. Um, nice view of both clusters, M46 and M47 in our field of view. Observations for three objects logged. All right, off we go. To the heart-shaped cluster, or M50. M50. Pretty close. It's amazing that there's no light out of the out of the telescope. It's pitch black out there tonight. That little red light that you see on the back wall where the roof is rolled off, that's just a little LED that's like a little wheat grain of the slightest orange light, but the whole telescope is being lit up by essentially nothing. It's just pure night vision camera with no infrared turned on even. So it's an amazing night vision camera, isn't it? It's a tap, tapo cam, I think it's called. Tapo something. Loving it. Okay, this is M50. And I can tune this up just a little bit. M50, the heart-shaped cluster. You guys are eating your supper over here. <laughs> Tiffany's got pasta, meat, and veggies, half Italian. I can't believe, Tiffany, you're making us all hungry. You're talking about your pasta. That'll be the next app that they add to live streaming, right? Anyway, um, this is in the constellation Monoceros, like rhinoceros, only Monoceros. It was recorded by G.D. Cassini before 1711 and independently discovered by Messier in 1772 while observing Biela's Comet. And sometimes it's described as the heart-shaped cluster or a blunt arrowhead. Okay, I'm not seeing the arrowhead. Uh, 508 confirmed and 109 probable don't they mean that the other way around? 508 probable and 109 confirmed members. It's estimated to be 
140 million years old. I'm just going to switch those because 508 probable and 109 confirmed members. An estimated apparent age of 140 million years. Thank you, Pete. I'm just not seeing the arrowhead. Tiffany, you're typically good at seeing these uh, shapes. In between bites, if we can just prevail upon you, are you able to make out anything that looks like an arrowhead here and help us out? Is this the point? These two stars? I'm kind of trying to back away for a minute. Maybe if this is the point and it comes down like this and then in and out and back to the point, Tiffany's going to go grab some more juice or something. Just leaving us stranded. Now, where's the heart? I guess. Ah, here's the heart. I think we found this once before. Here's the dividing part of the heart. It goes around like this to the point, back around like that. Okay, finally saw it without Tiffany's help. The view through the eyepiece can be very different than a camera. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, the heart is more easily discerned. Wow, that almost sounds metaphorical. Okay, that's our three minutes. That's how fast this messy marathon has to Observation go. Observation log. Let's head to M48. M48. Also known as NGC 2548. Selected. Thank you, Pete. And so for context, we're looking toward the south southwest part of the sky. So remember we were down here in the poop deck, the poopus puppies? Look, there's the electric guitar cluster. I bet that's where we get some of our noise. <laughs> Sorry, that's bad. Uh, we're up here off of Monoceros, aren't we? No? Actually, we're in Hydra, technically. You know, the movie? Hail Hydra. Um, this cluster was discovered by Charles Messier in 1771, but there is no cluster precisely where he said to go. He made an error as he did with M47. The value he gave for the right ascension matches, however, and his declination was off by exactly five degrees. So credit for discovery as a result is sometimes given to Caroline Herschel in 1783. It has an apparent age of 650 million years. So here's the live view. Tune it up just a little bit here. Again, this is M48. Our notes don't say how many stars that it has. Somebody take a guess. Of course, it's another one of those clusters you can't tell where it ends, huh? You know, a lot of people complain about the number of clusters in the Messier list, but, I mean, there are indeed a lot of clusters in the Messier list. 
but that's because there are a lot of clusters in the sky, for Pete's sake. So let's don't get all bummed out about it with Messier's list. He was just observation logged. He was listing what there is, you know, tell the truth. And of course, you guys know these clusters travel together. By the way, our sun was probably a member of a cluster and was probably ripped away from its fellow stars because this is how most stars are born. They're born in something like a star forming region like Messier 42, M42 is. So we were probably a member of a cluster, but we don't know where our other cluster stars ended up. They could be on the other side of the galaxy for all we know. Sometimes they're lost by those dogfights as it passes through another cluster or another galaxy. Larry says he loves the clusters. Many are colorful, usually easy to view actually, and globular clusters too. Right. Good point, Larry. Okay, so we already did the observation here, right? Did we? Observation log. All right. Now we get to go to M1. Now, when Messier recorded all these objects, he didn't do them, as you guys know, in any kind of uh, order as they appear in the sky. Instead, he did them in the order that he found them, which is I'm sure to him, very logical. It's not a problem for us because we can establish our sequence and look at them in whatever order we want, right? So I don't know why people rag on Chuck, sorry, Charles Messier, because there's no order. You know, because like the Caldwell list, it's like, Exactly in order of what? The deck, right? In declination. But I don't think it's so bad that he found them, that he listed them in the order that he found them. It's sort of like a historical order, right? So M1, it, uh, it is probably one of the most remarkable objects in the whole list because it is the result of something that we know that happened around 1054, some Chinese astronomers told us in their history that they noticed a supernova that blew up so bright that it was visible in the daytime sky for like two or three weeks. And then after it no longer was visible in the daytime sky, they continued to observe it in the nighttime sky for, what, months afterward? I forget. And in this exact location now, today, we see the stellar remains of this object. It was a supernova. And it's kind of a fun idea when you stop and think about it. This is like the carcass of a dead star. So it's not unlike something that you would find if you're out camping and you're walking along and you find this carcass of a big turkey buzzer or a big, I don't know, a dog or something. Except this carcass is still dynamically changing. We know that because even in the, what, couple hundred years that people have been observing and charting the night sky, this structure that we're seeing here has expanded visibly over those couple hundred years. And any, any star that's big enough to become supernova will apparently blow up and jettison off its outer material like, 
like this. Now this is different than a planetary nebula. Remember, a planetary nebula, it jettisons off its outer material, but it's not big enough to be a supernova. Instead, it just jettisons the outer layers, and then it shrinks back and fires back up, and the furnace comes alive again to burn other fuel, and then that lights up, that shell. But that's not what's happening here. This star completely exploded, and every single part of it, it blew it to smithereens. So there's no star left in this uh, system of, of expanding gases and dust and soot and carbons and everything, you know. A lot of the stuff that we find on our planet, it looks as if it could have come from supernova explosions. So when you get into this, like we're about three minutes here, we're already seeing some colors, aren't we? See those reds and greens? Now we're at 200%, so in other words, we're into the digital zoom. This is not a large object by any means. It's uh, eight arc, I'm sorry, six arc minutes wide. Six arc minutes by the lengthwise and four arc minutes wide. It's not a large object in the nighttime sky. But already you can see the greens, which would be like things like oxygen and, and all kinds of methanes and bunches of gases that are not hydrogen. And then the red would be all the hydrogen that's being lit up by this explosion that happened in 1054. Pretty amazing, huh? Pretty amazing. All right. Three minutes, or actually four minutes. We got to scoot. The next thing, oops. Lots of structure. Hydrogen, alpha, lots of greens. Amazing, from that 1054 explosion. Observation log. Let's go to M35. M35. Some people call this the shoe buckle cluster. Selected. Again, for um, context, we're pointed in a west-southwest direction. We're above Orion. See, we do these objects first because we want to get them as high as we can in the sky before they start setting. So here's Rigel of Orion, just getting ready to set its foot be behind our little trees. So we're up here just now by the toe of the twins, Jiminy. Here's Castor and there's Pollux. So almost due west. And we're up now at an altitude of about 41 degrees. The shoe buckle cluster. It's kind of fun. There's Vesta, not too far from here. The asteroid Vesta. Now in the same frame we can see, excuse me, NGC 2158, an open cluster that uh, Messier didn't see. But the main event is M35. So here's that other tiny cluster. I wonder if that's a glob. But anyway, M35 is wide open, also known as NGC 2168. It's um,
discovered by Philippe Le de Chiasso around 1745 and independently discovered by John Beavis before 1750. Scattered over part of the sky almost the size of the full moon, it's 2,970 light years away. Tiffany, oh, I just had the most pleasant surprise. My aunt and cousin dropped by to give me some eclipse glasses. So awesome. Love her family. Good job. Gerard uh, loved the view of the Crab Nebula, and he encouraged us on. Thank you, Gerard. You're like, you know, in a, in a flock of geese that are flying. They say that the lead, geese, lead goose is always kind of under pressure because of all the wind. So the other geese behind him are the one who are always uh, honking to let him know, we're back here, we're back here, we're with you, good job, we're with you. And the lead goose never honks because he's using all the all of the energy he has to keep pedaling. So you guys are just honking at me to say, we're with you, Doug, we're with you, Doug. <laughs> anyway, this is M35, the Shoebuckle Cluster. NGC 2168. We're going to ask Tiffany to find the shoe buckle. Colon. All right, Tiffany. Man, where in the world is the shoe buckle? What does a shoe buckle look like? Shoe buckle. Ah, one of those. Okay. Not seeing it, Tiffany. Pete, uh, if the um, quick observation panel, the EAACP observation panel, gets lost behind, I notice all I have to do is click on Astro Planner, and it brings the panel back up. So that's handy, huh? Tiffany says, I see a square form, like a pilgrim shoe buckle. I bet you're always good at doing connect the dot puzzles too, Tiffany. Not seeing it. She says she sees it. A square form. Like a pilgrim shoe buckle. Thus you have the fact that astronomy is a team sport because Tiffany's helping us see something that I can't see. So this line here, is it something? And then are you saying... Is it like that? Kind of rectangular? Anyway, that's five minutes. She put a smiley log. face there. Um, we got to push on, but what we need you to do, kind of locked to the side. Okay. Locked down here, like this. Well, astronomy is a team sport. Some bit of latency there. All right, now we're going to go to M37. M37. Selected. The January salt and pepper cluster.
Right there it is. Again, for context, we are right up by the top of Auriga. The brightest and richest open cluster in the constellation Auriga, discovered by the Italian astronomer Giovanni Battista Hodierna before 1654, is one of nearby outer arms. It is in one of the nearby outer arms of the Milky Way, I take it. It's one in one of the nearby outer arms. I'm just going to add there. It's one, it is in one of the nearby outer arms of the Milky Way galaxy. Still close enough to be in our own. Estimates of its age range from 347 million to 550 million has over 500 identified stars, and as of 2022, it contains only the third known planetary nebula associated with an open cluster. How about that? The cluster's angular diameter is 24 arc minutes. It corresponds to a physical extent of around 20 or 25 light years. That planetary nebula does not appear to be mentioned here, which is sadness. Let's go to the live view. Wow, it's beautiful, isn't it? Look at that. Let's darken that sky up a little. And then let's pump up the colors a little more. So what do you think? That orange thing or we're just at 100 seconds. Let's hurry up and bring up sky tools. Cause, Greg, due respect, if you really want to get to the to the deep sky chart of something, you want to bring up sky tools. Because it does have a better um, Giovanni Battista, is that John the Baptist in Italian? Huh, no, well, it might be. You think John the Baptist is an astronomer, Mike? This group of clusters is amazing when through binoculars. I bet you're right. Charioteers, some sweet clusters in that constellation. Oh, download, install. No. We just want to go to M37. And then we want to do the Sky Atlas. Well, how about that? I mean, it could be one of these outlying I don't think Sky Tools has it either. Anyway, thanks, Pete. Um, amazing bunch of stars. Supposedly a planetary. Nebula here, but Stellarium doesn't have it, nor did Sky Tools. Need more research on this. Observation log. Where's Stu tonight, Tiffany? Did Stu? Check in with you. And you know who else is not here? Ray. Off we go to M36.
Tiffany has night vision binoculars. Tiffany, that is so cool. They're very expensive too, Tiffany. Deep respect. You must have saved. Tim thought the last uh, salt and pepper cluster had a bit of a Christmas tree look. Gerard pointed out that Auriga was part of the winter octagon. Okay, for context for M36. Selected. Thanks, Pete. Um, for context, we're now inside. Is this the winter? You called it the winter octagon. Boy. Eight stars, huh? Anyway, we're inside of this thing. The head of Ariga. The charioteer, right? And this is called the Pinwheel Cluster, NGC 1960. Oh, yeah, I remember when we saw this before. Um, Tiffany's not seen Stu Array either. Oh, Stu's there! Stu, you rascal, you hadn't said hello yet. Good to have you, brother, down there in Tuaranga, New Zealand. Wow, so your brother gave you a pair of night vision binoculars? I'd send him a thank you note, Tiffany. Gerard says, Stu, it's not nice to lurk. Anyway, here's the pinwheel cluster, and uh, this is looking out again toward the north, the north, I mean the west northwest, west northwest part of the sky. And we're up about 37 degrees altitude now. The pinwheel cluster. Let's go to the live view. So this is live through the Rasa. And sure enough, somewhere here there's a pinwheel. Like this is one of the points. And that's apparently one of the points. And this, somehow, is one of the points. And that, and this. So I can see this one a lot better. We get the point on the pinwheel. Seriously. One, two, three, four, five, six. Five or six distinct points. Stu is using his grandfather's 70 year old binoculars. Oh, Gerard's got the uh, 10x50s from Orion with a new green laser pointer. Nice. Observation logged. Off we go. to the starfish cluster, M38. Selected. Thank you, Pete. Pete's actually very shy, and I'm sure it's irritating and annoying even. Did you guys know that I have a trip coming up next month to the UK, and I'm actually going to drive to the Isle of Wight and see Pete face to face and shake his hand. I am. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to personally thank him for the EAA control panel that he's made that ties together Astro Planner with Stellarium and SharpCap. Ties them all together into a three-piece software suite for electronically assisted astronomers. I'm going to drive down there. I had to make the trip anyway, and I'm adding on an extra day to it. I'm going to drive down 
take the ferry across to the Olive White, and I'm going to say, Pete, I'm going to face to face. Take him out to whatever he wants, fish and chips or something. I'm going to say, Pete, we in the EAA community are grateful. And he's going to be annoyed that I mentioned, I'm sure. But his wife and his daughter listen in on this sometimes. And I'm going to thank them as well for freeing Pete up to do this kind of thing. Okay, so we're in M38 zone now. <clears throat> M38. The starfish cluster. The starfish cluster looks a lot like the pinwheel cluster. <laughs> I mean, look, it's got those same points. How did they decide that one was a starfish and the other was a pinwheel? I don't know the answer to that. But for context, this is near the Flaming Star Nebula. It's, again, west-northwest. In fact, it's very close to this pinwheel cluster right here. Just couldn't fit them into one field of view. It's a little bit too much. Too many mids. Now what we can do, as you guys know, here in Shark Cap, thank you Robin Glover. Robin is also a really kind-hearted soul for uh, making it possible for us to do deep sky image annotation. And sure enough, right there is M38. We're spot on. But it looks just like the pinwheel cluster. Point, 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 point. This looked a lot like the pinwheel cluster to me. Tiffany says, Doug, that is so cool to go visit Pete. Um, thank him for us too. I'll do it, Tiffany. Stu says, give him a big kiss for me. I don't know about that, Stu. <laughs> Gerard says, Pete, you lucky man. George says, duh, come on up here, I'll take you to a few dark sky parks. Wow, that's nice of you to offer, Gerard. You're up in, where'd you say, eastern Michigan? Minnesota, Michigan. Yeah, another cool cluster to the lower left. Good job, Tim. Down here, let's go over and find out what that is. Stellarium sink. Observation logged. Thank you, Pete. Selected. M38. That must be NGC 1907. Yep. NGC 1907. Very cool. All right. Um, now what we try to do on here is we try to do every couple of hours in case you have to take a break Next object, by the way, is M44, which is a cool object. M44 is known as the Beehive Cluster. Selected. And it's also called, alternatively, Precep B. Precep B. Pre, precep B. Somebody looked this up and told me how to pronounce this once. But I've already forgotten. So we're going to go with the beehive cluster. It's also called the manger. Oh, precept is in there twice. Let's take that out. Right here. I like Astro Planner. This is an open cluster in the constellation Cancer. One of the nearest open clusters to Earth. It contains a larger 
population stars and other nearby bright open clusters holding around 1,000 stars. And for context, it's also toward the west, but more, more west-southwest. And it's in the constellation Cancer. So this is Cancer. Cancer the crab. Oh, I see it. Here are the two eyes. See the two eyes of the crab? How about that? So close to the two eyes. Wow, this is a big cluster. Um, under dark skies, the BF cluster looks like a small nebulous object with the naked eye and has been known since ancient times. Classical astronomer Ptolemy described it as a nebulous mass in the breast of Cancer. It's among the first objects that Galileo studied with his telescope, lots of Earth-like planets have now been discovered orbiting sun-like stars in this cluster. Could be looking at our escape planet that we have to go to if Earth gets so polluted beyond recognition. Now here's a live view. I'm going to add some color here. Look how big it is. I mean, it's huge. That whole thing must be the beehive. <whistles> Lots of stuff going on here. So M44, it kind of centers it right here. And all these other things. Oh, I bet you it's this whole thing. Let's look one more time in uh, Stellarium. Yeah, I think it's that whole thing. Amazing. The manger. Can anybody see a manger? Precipi. Okay, we'll go with yours, Larry. Starfish has a thicker body. It's a biblical donkey in the manger on Christmas Day. The manger is in the east while the northern cross sits in the west. This is lovely. Oh, 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 I remember. Look, see this V shape? Now, where's the donkey? Is this the donkey? Is that the tail? And look at the head of the donkey. Oh, my goodness. I'm seeing it. And there are two eyes. And here are the donkey legs, and the body, and the back donkey legs. What? I just want to get a Sharpie and start marking up my screen. Look at the manger. That's got to be the prize-winning coolest cluster of the night. A lot of blue, hot blue young stars. Okay, so we clearly could see the V of the manger, but Tonight, in all uppercase, we could see a perfect donkey. We so wanted to annotate the sharp cap screen. Wow. So, observation log. Pete, here's a question. How hard would it be to make it so we could annotate sharp cap? How hard would that be? So we could draw 
with like a yellow highlighter and draw the shape. Would that have to be a um, Robin Glover thing or? Sounds hard. Anyway, that's five minutes. We got a little carried away there with the donkey. But man, no wonder. That's cool, isn't it? Tiffany says, yes! <laughs> okay, next is King Cobra M67. King Cobra. Oh, we didn't have to move very much. It's kind of an anti-climax. Okay, so coming up on 11 o'clock, that's a good time if somebody needs to go for a, a break and grab, you know, some more pasta. Gerard says, talk about a miracle by design. Thank you, Jesus. He's talking about the manger of the donkey. It is. Well said, Gerard. You're the man. Now, it might seem like we've already covered a lot of the list, and we have. I forget how to tell. We don't have a way to tell how many we've observed in tonight's observing session, do we? It says 122 observed, but there are 122 objects. It just means at one time or another we've seen all of these before. We could perhaps force highlighting on the ones. No, there's not a choice for. But there is an edit custom highlighting. Can we say, wow, this is pretty cool. Observations. Where is the thing about observed in this 12 hours? Session. Pete's going to have to tell me what to pick. Pete, please come to my assistance. Um, one of these shows us that we've observed it in the past 12 hours. And then it would count and tell us how many we've seen. But I couldn't find it. Anyway, um, you can just manually count up by the fact that we missed two objects. And then we've got a couple of fake ones in there because of the pointers, the comet and the pointers. So we're about 28 objects along. This is King Cobra, otherwise known as NGC 2682, the Golden Eye Cluster. Just makes you want to go sing a James Bond song. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Selected. Doot, 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 doot. So again, it's in the Cancer constellation, and it's south, southwest. And we're up now about 57 degrees, pretty high in the sky. Yeah, baby. All right, so back to the live view. What are we seeing here? Gerard, Doug, you probably did all that in your sleep. Um... I should have, but I didn't. Hit the like button if you feel so inclined, wonderful people. <laughs> Tiffany, Tiffany's trying to help the channel grow 
If you click like, it helps other people find it. She's right. Uh, Gerard says, in college, my ethics teacher challenged me to prove God by design. Boy, did she get her eyes open. <laughs> Gerard, good job. Well, I don't know. We've got some stuff going up here, right? Are these, are these eyes? Are those supposed to be? There are three of them. Or are these the golden eyes? Two golden stars? I'm not seeing it. What about the fact that it's a cobra? Is it because of all this going on up here? Who thinks these names up anyway? I couldn't see the king cobra or the golden eye. Discovered by Kohler in 1779, between three and five billion years in its apparent age, and that's not the oldest known, but there are a few Milky Way clusters known to be older. But there are few known to be older in the Milky Way. And none of those is closer than M67. It's a paradigm study object in stellar evolution. It's well populated, has negligible amounts of dust obscuration, and all of its stars the same distance and age, save for approximately 30 anomalous blue stragglers. Blue stragglers, that's cool. M67 is one of the most studied open clusters, 500 members. Observation log. Yeah, I'm not seeing the cobra. Unless it's all this, all these folds up here. Anyway, that's five minutes on the king cobra. Off we go. To this pointer star, which will take us to M95. M96 and M105. So now you see the telescope is doing a meridian flip. So it had to kick the weights all the way over on the east side, and now the scope is pier west. And that's because it had to cross that meridian line. So notice how we're still almost straight up, but we're almost just a little bit east of the meridian now. And sure enough, we go to Stellarium. Selected. Thank you, Pete. Then, look, the scope is right here. And if you back off, you can see here we're on the east side of the meridian. Now, if we stayed here very long, the scope would back into the meridian. And sometimes it flips on around automatically. And I've noticed sometimes it just complains. I don't know why it does one or the other but I just try not to let it happen anymore. Anyway, look how this is right below Leo the Lion. See the backward question mark? The nebula and Regulus? So the lion is jumping over the meridian. And right below the lion's belly is M95, M96, and M105. So in our view, we should see 95 up top, 96 in the middle, and 105 is the top object of a little threesome. And Messier didn't see the other two. He just saw 105. Or he just noted 105 in his notes. So let's remember, 95, 96, 105, top to bottom. How do I know this is the top? I think because the print is oriented that way. Okay, let's go check it out. So 95, 96, 105, and Messier didn't note these two. Why did he see this one and not those two? I don't know. 
95-96-105. 95 is a barred spiral about 33 million light years away in the zodiac constellation of Leo, discovered by Pierre Michin in 1781. Scope Cam. Thank you, Tiffany. So, Gerard, yes, we're stacking and zooming. So, this M95 is the barred spiral. So, let's see if we can see the bar. Sure enough, after just 120 seconds, there's that beautiful bar. It's amazing, isn't it? And then here is the Ninety six. M ninety six is in an intermediate spiral galaxy about thirty one million light years away in the constellation Leo, discovered by the French astronomer Pierre Michin in seventeen eighty one, categorized a double barred spiral galaxy. With a small inner bulge through the core along with an outer bulge. Oh. It's about the same mass and size as the Milky Way. So we're looking at a mirror version of ourselves. Look at that. This is three minutes of integration. Very asymmetric. Dust and gas are unevenly spread throughout its weak spiral arms, and its core is just offset from the midpoint of its extremes. See some of the cores over here? Its arms are also asymmetrical, thought to have been influenced by the gravitational pull of other galaxies within its group. Lots of spiral material that would come in if we had longer to observe. Inner bulge, outer bulge. Tim says, wow, that is amazing. Gerard says, sweet. Tiffany says, that is a beautiful group of objects. <laughs> Tiffany, thank you for watching my back. Here is a satellite discovered in 2024 by Tiffany. Uh, here is M105, which looks very elliptical-ish. M105... An elliptical galaxy 36.6 million light years away. Boy, we got that down to a science. It's the biggest elliptical galaxy in the Messier catalog that is not in the Virgo cluster. Discovered by Pierre Michin again in 1781, the galaxy is only a few not object verified by Messier, so it was omitted in the editions of his galaxy, of his catalog of his era. And it was appended when Helen S. Hogg found a letter by Michin locating and describing the object which matched those aspects under its first published name, NGC 3379, known to have a supermassive black hole at its core. And so what happened was Michin wrote it to uh, Messier, and Messier then uh, mentions it in his, uh, you know, notes, but he never published it. So that's why it has that higher number. Remember, uh, the ones above, what was it, 100, were not published by Messier. They were added afterward. So that's this elliptical. Elliptical just means we can't find any spiral arms. It just means it's blobbish. Nice looking group. And it really helped to use the pointer star, ty pointer star Tycho 00849-06231. Thank you, Tycho. We could easily see the bars, the bar in M95, but only one bar in M96. However, we could make out 
the asymmetrical core and arms affected by tidal forces. M105 indeed looked blobbish. Three for the price of one. Three observations, all in one click. Observations for four objects logged. Wow. I guess it included the Tycho Star. <laughs> Thank you, Pete. All right. Now we're ready to hop to HD98388 in order to see another triple. This is the Leo triplet. This M65, M66, and M, ah, NGC3628, NGC3628. So only two Messier objects, and for some reason, Messier didn't get to see NGC 3628 in his day. Selected. It's worth... Oh, Gerard saw another fainter deep sky object. Uh, must have been a whole group, huh, Gerard? It's worth noting... Oh, I see why Messier didn't discover it. It's so big, and I bet that magnitude is scattered out. So... The luminance gets distributed across a broader area and it makes it dimmer, so you didn't see it from Paris. So you see our pointer star we use, and that lets us see all three carefully in our, in our field of view. So it's a Leo triplet. This is M65, M66, and then the NGC 3628. So for our purposes tonight, 65 is on top, and again, I know that because, look, the frame automatically tries to adjust by the way that our scope is oriented sideways in the sky. And the frame tries to represent that by those smart people who programmed Stellarium. Okay, so let's go over here now and see it. So 90, 65 is here. Kind of looks like a face, doesn't it? Again, if I had a, Pete, if I had a yellow highlighter, I'd draw a face around the whole thing. Uh, 65 is here. 66 is here. And this is NGC 3628. The Hamburger Galaxy. Fittingly named, as long as you have a hamburger press. Boy, it just looks like a stereotypical, it's an intermediate spiral galaxy 35 million light years away in the constellation Leo with its highly equatorial southern half. It was discovered by Charles Messier in 1780 with M66 and NGC 3628. It forms the Leo triplet. I think this looks very space age-ish. This one looks like a storm has hit, right? An intermediate spiral in the southern equatorial half of Leo was discovered by French astronomer Charles Messier on 1st of March, 1780. This galaxy is a member of the Leo triplet. Not much about it, but it looks like it's been disturbed a little bit, doesn't it? See how this arm is kind of twisted down? And I'm going to guess that it was disturbed by our friend Our friend, doo -doo 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 -doo, the pressed hamburger, uh, NGC 3628. This is just a layer of dust 
that's in front of the edge of this galaxy. So the galaxy really isn't divided like that. But the dust is so dark that it literally bisects the galaxy and makes it look like the buns of a hamburger. But that's a big layer of dust and carbon at the edge of that spiral arm that's been thrown out by the spiral arms because we're looking at it edge on. Um, beautiful spiral of M65 and amazing asymmetrical M66 complete in a waltz with this NGC 3628 hamburger which is edge on exactly the dust bisecting it. Observations for four objects logged. Including the pointer star in the middle. I love the fact that it's like two eyes and a mouth, don't you guys? <laughs> Tiffany says, simply gorgeous. Gerard says, can't get enough of the Leo Virgo, Virgo region. Gerard says, Virgo should be coming. Uh, let's hope so. All right, so um, we're ready for another two-for-one special. This one is M81 and M82. And to get there, we go to Tycho 04383-0198 space 1. And that's going to let us see M81 and M82. Oh, so what we had to do is uh, kick around the meridian again, didn't we, gang? So you see the weights going up in the west? Weights up. And the scope is now pier east. Can you see the little red uh, LED on the back of the motorized focuser at the back of the optical tube assembly? The OTA, it's called, the optical tube assembly. See that little red LED? That's the, the motorized focuser. Just for reference, this would not be visible at all to us without stacking. Selected. M81 and M82. Cigar Galaxy and Bode's Galaxy. So these are going to be reversed. Look how the words are over here. So Cigar Galaxy is M82. It's on the left. So let's remember that. M82 is on the left. M81 on the right. We might see the Garland Galaxy in the lower right. It's NGC 3077, by the way. Cigar Galaxy, M82, left. Well, I don't think that's correct. I think this is a cigar galaxy and it's on the right. So I don't think it did orient our field of view correctly with the print right side up. Anyway, the Cigar Galaxy is on the right. Otherwise known as M82. 
Yeah. And M81 is here, and that's 3077. Bode's galaxy. That's a beautiful galaxy already after just 60 seconds. Uh, let's see, I'm going to hold the shift key down while I mouse, and that lets you fine tune it. So I want to try to get just a little bit more of that, uh, the spiral arm structure, and then let's zoom in on that. And then let's use our mids, make them just a little bit hotter. Keep sliding those bins over until the sky glow starts to annoy us just a little bit, and then we back off one notch. And that way we're leveraging as many of those mids in the galaxy as we can. Now see the sky glow is starting to heat up just a little too much, so I'll go just a little bit to the right. Bode's Galaxy. Tiffany, two for one. Love a good bargain. <laughs> Tiffany's asking the question, is it green? I doubt it. I think if it has a greenish tint, it's just my poor color balance. So I'm going to tap down on the green just one click. Oop, <laughs> that's too much. Now it's got a distinct purple, right? You know, the light pollution filter that we use does have a greenish tinge, and so I've heard people say that with this light pollution filter, you do pick up a green tinge on some objects. And let's look and see which direction we're pointed. Yeah, see all this light pollution here. It's possible. Did we already orient this in? Selected. Stellarium. You know, this is this is north northwest and it is in the direction of Louisville so we are getting a little more light pollution from this so that could be the green that you're picking up bottom line look at all of these stars forming out here in these arms it's like a uh, star factory out there that's four minutes. Look at all of the infrastructure out here. Multiple trails that are being, I take it, interrupted by this. Now this has multiple colors, and they say this is being interrupted by M81. So... M81, a grand design spiral galaxy about 12 million light years away in the constellation Ursa Major, 96,000 light years wide. Because of its relative proximity to the Milky Way and its large size and active galactic nucleus, which harbors 70 million solar masses and a giant supermassive black hole, Messier 81 has been studied extensively by professional astronomers. In late February, 2022, astronomers reported that M81 might be the source of this big long number FRB thing, a repeating fast radio burst. Messier 81 was first discovered by Johan Ellert Bode, that's the name, Bode's Galaxy, 31st of December 1774, thus it is sometimes referred to as Bode's Galaxy. Late February 2022, astronomers reported that M81 may be the source. Oh, that's a repeat. I'm going to take that extra thing out. Got that in there twice. Okay. 
and then the cigar galaxy M82 Wow, isn't that complex looking? Look at that. What is it? What is all that going on in the middle? A starburst galaxy approximately 12 million light years away in the constellation of Ursa Major it is the second largest member of M81 group. Has a diameter of 40,800 light years. It's about five times more luminous than the Milky Way, and its central region is about 100 times more luminous. The starburst activity is thought to have been triggered by interaction with neighbor galaxy M81. As one of the closest starburst galaxies to the Earth, M82 is prototypical example of this galaxy type, producing multiple supernovae. Novae. Novi. In 2014, in studying M82, scientists discovered the brightest pulsar yet known, designated M82 X 2. Beep, 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 right there in M82. Well, that's seven minutes, but we did two objects, right? Wow. This is an interesting pair, isn't it? Tiffany says, it's still very pretty. Frank says, color camera sensors use the Bayer matrix, which is two green, one red, and one blue filter per pixel, resulting in many objects having a green bias until they're properly color corrected. Yeah, Frank. Now, if I hold out my shift key and click the green bar, does it do a smaller amount? Nope, it still lets it shift way purplish. What if I just hold down the shift and try to move it? Oh, that's a possibility. Yeah, baby. So hold down the shift and drag the, the green bar and you can get rid of that green. It's like, that looked better to you, Tiffany. Gerard, Doug, the polar region has been noted to have rapidly expanding with new star fields. Cool. In fact, several luminous nova have been discovered in that area. You're talking about M82, right, Gerard? So Tiffany, did that help with the green? Now that Frank has told us about our Bayer metric, matrix, I did know that there were two green pixels, whatever, two green, whatever, for every uh, red and blue. I did know that, but I'd forgotten it until Frank reminded us. Thanks, Frank. I think that looks better. Let's save that as a picture. Do 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 do. Okay. Eight minutes, so four minutes per object, we're okay. Boy, it's just a little bit latent here. Default next target. Um, did we observe these? I don't think we did. Wow, Bodes looked great, especially after Frank reminded us of the two green cells in each pixel, I used the shift key and pulled the green bar down ever so slightly to get rid of some of Tiffany's Errant green. And Tiffany, I think I've mentioned to you before that I'm red green colorblind. Observations for three objects logged. So it's only natural that I wouldn't have complained about the green because I don't see it very well anyway. Let's do a two for one special and we're going to zero in on the Owl Nebula M97. and M108. Tiffany says, Doug, stunning. And then she says, thanks. <laughs> Gerard, yes, and the Ursa Major bear, too. How about that? Really love the dark nebulosity gas region in the Cigar Galaxy. Yeah, me too. Okay. So we switched the Meridian again.
but we don't mind this because we plate solve every time. Now, you know, uh, astronomers who don't plate solve probably get annoyed by all these meridian hops that we're doing, but it doesn't really bother me that much because we plate solve every single observation. So that means we're always cleaning up any of the gear backlash that might have resulted from that um, pier flip, meridian flip. Tiffany clarified, wasn't complaining, you know, she says, no complaints here. <laughs> Thanks, Tiffany. In our sequence, I don't mention our, I don't mention the fact that we're using a sequence of steps, and maybe, if you're new to the channel, by the way, welcome. Uh, we've got about 20 people observing tonight with us. This is awesome. And if you're watching the recorded version, again, welcome. I don't mention these sequences very often, but the truth is they really do come in handy, don't they? Uh, they take care of a lot of the background stuff so we don't have to, and I think that's really awesome. So one of the things they take care of is the plate solving. It's all done in the background. And they also take care of like adjusting the observing uh, exposure. We use uh, longer exposures on the actual uh, live stacking than we do on the when we're trying to find things. And we use uh, less gain than when we're trying to find things as well. Okay, so as you can tell, this is another planetary nebula, and it's known as M97. Selected. And just for context, we are now fully inside of Ursa Major, just right off of the bottom of the cup of the Dipper. So this is the Big Dipper, and you of course know that's in the north, and tonight it's right square north. And we're up now, about 73 degrees. So this is an ideal placement to be able to see this Owl Nebula, or M97. Then the other object with us in this frame is the surfboard galaxy, which is M108. I don't know if we'll see this NGC 3504, I'm sorry, 3594, but it's also in the frame in case we see that. So 97, 108, and then possibly this NGC galaxy. So we see 97, ah, we see 108, and here's that little NGC galaxy, that Messier didn't catch, understandably so, it just looks like a fat star. Okay, so this is the Owl Nebula, it's another one of those planetary nebulae, and in this case, we can see the central star really well, can't we? See the little white star in the middle? Now, Tiffany, ask your question. Is that green? <laughs> yeah. Um, in this case, it is green. It's uh, thought to be layers of oxygen, of course, and methane and everything else that gets burned and lit up as green. But what's neat is this little hourglass shape, which comes across as the eyes of the owl, little hourglass shape is again an example of the way the star has polarity. The north and south poles being here, and this almost just looks like a drawing of the magnet uh, shavings, you know, that you might see if you were in fifth grade doing an experiment with, with magnets. And all of the, all of the green is all of the the shavings, you know, that are aligning themselves around that central star in polarity. But in reality, they're not shavings. They're gases that were ejected off. Like we said a while ago with the planetary nebula, this white dwarf here in the middle started out to be a bigger star and jettisoned all these layers out. 
can probably see there are probably multiple colors. Somebody with better color vision than I can, than I have, I bet those outer layers almost have a tinge of red, don't they? Now we would never see this in a live telescope looking through an eyepiece. You would never see that red. It's only visible because we're in four minutes of stacked frames, 20 second exposures, frames that are being averaged together, you start seeing that color difference of those outer layers. So Tiffany, see if you can see if you can see that color difference. Oh no, have you guys been on scope cam the whole time? I'm so sorry. So again, you're seeing the, the polarity and the green, and then look at the outer layers of, those are probably red, aren't they, Tiffany? Tim says, it's quite a hoot. Gerard says, this is much better than blurred trees. Tiffany says, I'm feeling blessed to have the gift of sight. Gerard says, look at all those millions of stars. Tiffany says, EAA rocks. Yes! <laughs> so are you seeing those colors, Tiffany? Somebody with good color definition, I bet, sees those a lot better. Yes, red, she says. And then that's uh, the owl, 97. And then this 108 thing. Where are you, 108? Here we go. Now this is another one of those uh, fireworks, you know? Fireworks galaxies that are producing all the new stars. So let's look at 97's uh, data here, 2,000 light years away. Discovered by Pierre Michin, February 16, 1781, 8,000 years old, approximately circular, cross-section with a faint internal structure formed from the outflow of material from the stellar wind of the central star, evolved along the asymmetric giant branch. The nebula is arranged in three concentric shells, with the outermost shell being about 20 to 30% larger, and the inner shell is uh, shaped by that polarity, forms a bear-like structure aligned at an angle 45 degrees the line of sight. Cool. And then the M108, which is called the Surfboard Galaxy, a barred spiral about 28 million light years from Earth, the northern constellation of Ursa Major discovered by Pierre Michel in 1781. It's almost seen edge on. Fireburst Galaxy. M108 looks like another example of a fireburst galaxy. We could see reddish tinges in the outer belt of M M97, the owl. Ray, good to have you here. We were missing you all ago. Gerard says, best he's ever seen of the owl. Red outer, green inner, yep. Tiffany says to Ray, missed you. Gerard says, welcome to the big show. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Quite the Observations crew. Observations for two objects logged. Quite the crew you guys are. All right. We are ready for M109. Sometimes, when I forget to change back from the sky, from the scope cam, sometimes you guys just say, Doug, just leave it <laughs> on the screen cam. Because <laughs> they say, because Doug, really, with deep respect, <laughs> yeah, we know you've got a lot going on, Doug, but honestly, you forget. <laughs> so, um, 
So you're probably right. We should just leave it. And after all, on this, the screen view, you can still see the scope on the right anyway. It's just a smaller view, right? Right. Selected. M109 is the vacuum cleaner galaxy. <laughs> it's right by the edge of the bottom of the Big Dipper cup. Right by the edge in Ursa Major. Wow. That's a cool galaxy. We've got a very bright star, and the bright star we see in our field of view is the bottom of the Big Dipper Cup. So that's interesting. Let's go see. So that is the star Fecda. Fecda. It's the bottom of the Big Dipper Cup. And here is M109. the way it has like multiple spiral arms. I think that's perfectly tuned as best we can get it. It's just because it's just 60 seconds. It's got a little bit of grain left in it. A little bit of noise. But you can see the bar already. Even at uh, 60 to 80 seconds you can see the bar. But look at that complicated spiral structure. A barred spiral galaxy exhibiting a weak inner ring structure around a central bar approximately 67 plus or minus 23 million light years away <laughs> in the northern constellation Earth's major. Messier 109 was discovered by Pierre Michan in 1781. Between the 1920s through the 1950s, it was considered that Messier object over 103 were not official. But latest, later the additions further referred target objects from Meshen became more widely accepted by the late 1970s. All 110 objects are commonly used among astronomers and remain so. The galaxy is the most distant object in the Messier, Messier catalog, followed by M91. Okay, so here's my question. Why do we call it the vacuum cleaner, pray tell? We saw the bar. My watch just went off. Must have been 11.45. We saw the bar um, after just 60 seconds of integration. The complex spiral arm structure is amazing. Hi, Dave. Good to have you here. Thanks for stopping by. So, what do you guys think? Is this called a vacuum cleaner because it looks like the side view of the... It really does look a bit like the side view of a vacuum cleaner roller. The farthest Messier object, 67 million light years, plus or minus 23 million. <laughs> so anywhere between 30 to 90 million light years away. Observation log. So this is the part where we just have to like back off for a second and appreciate, like we've done before on this channel, that these photons were traveling in these waves 30 to 90 million years. And then we add with an asterisk, in apparent 
intergalactic time, as far as appearances go. Maybe God created the universe, you know, 4,000 years ago. But if he did, he created it already in motion. He made it so that the moment he created it, he created it as if these photons had been flying here for 30 million to, to 60 million or more years, 30, 30 to 90 million years ago. And I don't know what things were like on Earth because nobody was around. And we don't have any YouTube videos from 30 million years ago. But whatever it was like, it certainly isn't like it is now. And all that while, those photons were traveling, we need to note, at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, 186,000 miles per second for 30 to 90 million years. And tonight, their voyage ended forever. They will never travel again. The photons that you are viewing with me, real time, have stopped their voyage tonight on the mirror of this telescope. And now, those photons have bounced up into our camera and we're appreciating them and their journey is done and they're very tired and we're glad to relieve them of their voyage but think we're looking at something that was and the little telescope 200 feet away out there in the field the little telescope is just 11 inches wide and it trapped enough photons to see this even though it's 30 to 90 million light years away. These distances are to me just astounding. Tiffany says, an upright electrolux. Ray, that's what I see in it. Tiffany says, mind blown. Ray says, maybe time is irrelevant. <laughs> you could be right. Well, we'll snap a quick picture at seven minutes, and although we paused too long, for a messy marathon on this object, it is the farthest object of all 110 objects. So it's the farthest one we'll see tonight. So it's fitting that we do this little observation on this. Now, if we're gonna if we're gonna go quickly on an object, let's go quickly on the next one. Because the next object is M40. And honestly, if you're walking through one of those outdoor markets, you know, you visit, you're on, a, you're on a cruise in the Bahamas, and you go to an outdoor market, and you see all kinds of fruits and vegetables, and they have different Messier numbers on them. If you see one labeled M40, don't pay very much for it. Because it's really just two stars. And that's it. Two stars. Now, I don't know why Messier thought Selected. that this object should be in his catalog. But he did. And so he put two stars. It's just two stars. And the theory is that, you know, his... His nice telescope was metal plate, didn't amount to that much. I don't mean to diss his telescope, but it's just a metal plate, not a mirror. Couldn't swap out eyepieces, permanent eyepiece welded into the scope, so to speak. Probably what, four inch scope wide at the time, I don't know. He must have seen a little bit of nebulosity here. Maybe because this star was interfering, maybe because this little thing was looking hazy, but he said this was an object. So I'm just going to say here in the quick observation, two stars. Bam. That's it. Observation logged. Next object. 
you know, it's just one of those mysteries. We just don't understand. Binary star? I don't know. Uh, an optical double. It's not even a true binary. Two unrelated stars. 1754. He was searching for a nebula that had been reported by Johann Hevelius. Not seeing any nebula, he cataloged these two stars, guessing that that's what Hevelius meant. And they were rediscovered by a guy named August, see, Frederick August Theodore Winnecke in 1863. So he put them in the Winnecke catalog of double stars. And Burnham calls this one of the few real mistakes in Messier's catalog. Faulting Messier for including it when all he saw was a double star, not any nebula of any sort. So thus, with deep respect, Charles, we push on. Two stars. The next object is M106. And it is not two stars. Tiffany says, definitely ask for a discount. Larry might have been a comet there, but he misrecognized it. Well, I guess that's a possibility, Larry. You'll have to advance that theory on your favorite astronomy forum and see what they think. I'm sure somebody has the wherewithal to research when comets were around. Selected. Or maybe it was a one-time comet that we don't know about. You've got a right to your theory. and Stick with it, Larry. Okay, so M106 is a real live object. It's a nice spiral galaxy. Looks like it has a satellite out here, NGC 4248. And look at all these other companion galaxies traveling with it. Canis, Canis Venetici, discovered by Pierre Michin in 1781 has a central supermassive black hole. It's one of the largest and brightest nearby galaxies, similar in size luminosity to the Andromeda galaxy. And again, we're still near Ursa Major, and Canis Venetici is basically these two stars here. So right in between the Big Dipper and those two stars. Canis Venetici. Here's Bootes. So you see, look at all these companion galaxies. But there is M106. Boy, it's quite a good looking one, isn't it? Wow! You know, I remember seeing this before and thinking how much it looks like something that... Remember Lando Calarissian? This reminds me of that place where his headquarters was. Just like a place in the clouds. You could just picture his, uh, you know, palace being here. Don't you wish that galaxies made noises? I mean, wouldn't it be great? I know that noise needs to travel in a, an atmosphere to be a noise. And space is more vacuum than noise, more vacuum than atmosphere. So you can't really hear noises in space. But what would this galaxy sound like? I mean, I, I would have to believe it would have this, you know, burning sound as it churned just like it's on fire. Maybe every once in a while there'd be a lightning bolt 
Instead, it just goes. What do you guys think of all that? Larry says, Music of the Spheres. We wish this galaxy would make noise. Larry said, The Music of the Spheres. I bet it would crackle and thunder. Looks like Lando Calarissian's How We Spell Out. Calarissian's home place. It's the Lando Calarissian law. galaxy. Well, we must push on, guys. I know we need to give you a break. It's uh, coming up on uh, midnight. So we're going to take a two minute break here in a minute just to give everybody a chance to stretch. And what we'll do is we'll go to this next object, which is M94. And looks like it's settled. We'll let it be settling there and let it cook while we take our quick break. Wow, I love the sound of M81. <laughs> Tiffany likes the idea of noise. Ricky says, I know the noise. Zoya flowers. <laughs> All right, so quick break.
selected.
mic two at all. So I'm sorry about that. As you picked up, that mic um, died. So we'll recharge it. And in fact, I'll go ahead and plug it in over here just in case that charges it faster. So it'll be ready for later. There we go. I'm sorry about that. This is the problem with using a wireless mic, huh? I wonder if this mic could plug into the computer when it has all those extra rings. It's like got four parts. Will it still plug in? Let's try it. I'm going to plug it in here. And then I'm going to go to the audio settings. And I'm going to say microphone array. Can you hear that? Can you hear me now? Hello? 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 Is that mic better? That's the lavalier without the little wireless thing. So somebody tell me if, if that's better. Do you like that better than the webcam, in other words? It looks like it's pumping on the little VU meter. I mean, it's got a lot of, Gerard says, what did you say? <laughs> Which do you prefer? Do you like the uh, lavalier, which is what I have now, or the, the webcam? Okay, you must like, the, the lavalier must work, right? Okay, we're going to leave the lavalier. Uh-oh. Choppy sound. Okay. Let's go back to audio and choose the webcam. Now, how about that? That's the webcam mic. Is that better? The webcam mic testing one, two, three, test. This is a uh, Logitech, whatever it's called, C920 or something. Hello, hello, hello. Are we good to go? Hello? Yes? Okay. Let's go with this and then when the, um, when the, Wireless mic is back. We'll switch back to that one. Okay. Thanks, Ricky. Thanks, Ray. Yeah, I did charge the batteries. It's just they only last for three hours, as you saw. So I'm going to have to have a better solution. If we're going to use wireless lavaliers, I'm going to have to have a better solution for a marathon. You're right. All right, let's get one more look at this since we let it integrate a little bit more. This is the 13-minute version. Beautiful, no doubt about it. Okay, we've definitely got latency now. Look at that. Oh, maybe that was because we were taking a picture of it though. Okay, so the Crocs eye. Beautiful flocked like cotton candy outer ring system. Amazing detail in inner rings. Um, large core. Gorgeous. Observation logged. All right, the next object is 
M63. M63. And M63 is the Sunflower Galaxy. Selected. It is uh, also known as NGC 5055. It's a spiral galaxy. And it's in Canis Venatici. 400 billion stars. <clears throat> First discovered by Pierre Machin, <clears throat> verified by Messier, and also Lord Rossi discovered spiral structures within it, making it one of the first <clears throat> galaxies where spiral structures were identified. So again, you can see we're in the north. Now we're in the east, northeast, still close to Canis Venatici. This is about 27 million light years away. Again, about 13 arc minutes wide. We're up at 71 degrees altitude. Still a lot of noise there, but you can already see this is just a gorgeous galaxy. Ray says, your images are coming in really nice. Did you make any changes on the settings? No, Ray, I didn't, but that's so nice of you to say. I need to make a note to send you like some kind of special fruitcake or something or some kind of chocolate bar. Thanks for the encouragement, though. This galaxy I've noticed in the past, it just keeps getting better and better the longer you stay on it. Now, tonight, we're only going to be able to be on it for... Uh, you know, four minutes, max. But the longer you stay on it, the more this outer ring area just looks like cotton candy or like a giant sunflower, if you want to go with the name. really does look like a sunflower or a giant flat pizza of cotton candy. Bright core. Stu says, practice makes perfect. Ray, must be very clear and good observation atmosphere we have tonight. You guys are nice to encourage. Observation log. It is. It is a really nice night. It's pitch black and very clear, uh, no moon at all. And you guys are probably used to those nights when we try to observe with 67% moon or whatever. And these objects that we're working on right now, to be fair, they are very big and bright. And remember, some of these books that we've worked on, the objects are so exotic and so tiny and so peripheral to these mainline objects. I think that's part of it too. After a while, it begins to feel like, wow, none of these are bright and beautiful. It's because we're, we're scouting out beyond the Messier list. So it's nice to be back in some of these mainline objects, isn't it? But I think the other thing is it is a very dark, black, very pitch black night, no moon, and high altitude objects. Well, that's three minutes, so we're going to call it, but sure is beautiful, isn't it? Stu says, third time's a char charm with the Messier Marathon. Gerard says, yeah, if there were dew or ground fog, it would make a difference. You remember that. Ray says, yep, those things are all probably it, and he likes it. Me too. Well, it's a shame to move on because that object really is beautiful the longer you stay on it.
But let's go to M51, the Whirlpool, and that's a good object too, isn't it, gang? Selected. M51 is right here at the edge of the Big Dipper's handle. So see, we're, we're right underneath the handle, the, the last star, which is called Al-Qaeda. Right underneath that handle, right now, of course, it's upside down. So we'd have to say it's above the handle uh, when you're dumping the water out. And here we're back to the live view as it pops in from the first 20 second frame. Ray is imaging the horse head now, and it looks great also. I bet it does, Ray. So right off the bat, with just 20 seconds, this is an amazing object, isn't it? Whirlpool, question mark, galaxy. This is an interacting, grand design galaxy with Seifert II active galactic nucleus. It lies in the constellation Canis Venatici and was the first galaxy to be classified as a spiral galaxy, 76,900 light years in diameter. So I guess for perspective, that's a little smaller, isn't it, than the Milky Way. It's paired with NGC 5195, or M51b, Bravo, and it's among the most famous and relatively close interacting systems, and thus is a favorite subject of galaxy interaction models. The other night when we were looking at this in one of our practices of the Messia Marathon, I thought maybe this was, this should be called the lizard galaxy. And the lizard has reached out with his tongue and has caught a fly with its tongue. And it's now curled its tongue and lapped around that fly and it's pulling it back in. And once I saw that, my image of M51 forever changed after that. And now I can't help but see it when I look at M51 and it looks to me like something that would be on a bad science fiction movie. So now when I look at it, it doesn't have that romance kind of thing anymore. Instead it looks like, you know, so that's really sad. Gerard said, folks pray, the Lord heard the prayers, gave us a night to remember. Woohoo! I'm gonna go with your idea, Gerard. Wow, see it's 59 degrees out at Ray's place in Colorado. Yep, chameleon catching a firefly. Yep, Stu sees it too. Boy, look how it only took two minutes to make this really detailed. Look at all of the fireworks going on in these arms. Of course, you know what they say. They say that galaxies that are interacting are usually more active in producing stars, you know, giving birth to stars. So this one would support that hypothesis. No matter how you slice it, it really is a cool look, isn't it? Well, that's three minutes. Snap a quick picture there. Can't help but see that lizard catching a fly. Or, as Stu put it, a chameleon catching a firefly. Okay, I got a minute. That's a little bit more picturesque. A little bit. Lots of detail 
in these arms. Fireworks. Forty degrees where Gerard is. Yikes. I guess it's uh, 43 here, so not much difference. 43 degrees Fahrenheit here. Observation logged. Now we head to M101, the pinwheel. Selected. Thank you, Pete. And M101 is just above the handle of the Big Dipper. So we're still in the north, northeast. But instead of being below it, now we're on the side of the water dumping out. And of course, you're familiar with the Pinwheel Galaxy, I bet. It is an amazing structure. You can see there is a, another NGC object out here. In fact, several. We could see several in this frame and several even around the pinwheel because of all of the different uh, nebulae within the pinwheel. We did a video the other night focused just on all those nebulae. You probably already saw it, perhaps, if you're already uh, part of the channel. It's shorter. It's like 15 minutes. And we, we identify painstakingly every one of these nebulae so if you haven't seen that, it's worth a watch. It's just 15 minutes. Quite noisy so far, isn't it? This noise, it's just random noise that is generated by the camera itself. And then some light pollution from the city of Louisville, of course. But that's the advantage of this stacking. Uh, the noise has a tendency to tingle and like glisten or sparkle, whereas the light from the stationary objects, it's a lot more steady. So when Robin Glover invented uh, sharp cap, he used the concept that astrophotographers use in their processing of images after they take the picture, and he made it live, thus the name Live Stack. And what this is doing now, sharp cap in its like RAM in its brain. Not storing these stacks on anybody's computer, it's just averaging out stacks in its brain, live. And when it does that, it averages out all that tingling and gets rid of it all, so the glistening stuff sort of drops out into the background and becomes black. And the light from the star and the light from the galaxy gets averaged brighter and brighter and brighter with every layer that's averaged in. So you can see already the image has improved quite a lot. And I've got it tuned up pretty loud here. So let's hold the shift key down and make the background one notch darker. And let's leave the mids up that high so we can see all these nebulae. See, there's a nebula. There's a nebula, and all these nebulae have names. Every one of these nebulae have a separate name. And every one of them is probably star forming region. So you're looking at a, a star forming nebula, a star forming nursery, even though it's a spiral galaxy. Pretty fun, huh? Ray already looked at the um, at the 
nebulae in the Whirlpool Galaxy video, so thanks, Ray. Well, that's three minutes. Boy, it seems insulting. Just three minutes on M101, huh? But that's the nature of the Messier Marathon. We shove on. It's kind of like going to a Ponderosa instead of a nice restaurant where you get amazing starburst in the arms. Beautiful detail. Even after just three minutes. Observation log. Next we go to M102. And M102 is another one of those objects that was added after Messier was gone. Still, you can see we're up there in that Big Dipper region. And that's pretty dark. We need to brighten that up some, don't we? Let's go brighten that up some. Let's make this three seconds. It's a little better, isn't it? Spindle Galaxy. Selected. Thanks, Pete. Now we're sort of creeping down closer to Draco. 54 degrees altitude. So still northeast, almost due northeast now. The Spindle Galaxy. Fairly tiny, isn't it? It's like an edge on spiral, isn't it? Looks like uh, one of the Jetsons flying saucers. Observed by Machin in late March or early April 1781, was added by Messier to the final version of his catalog. So it was in the final version in 1781. However, Messier did not include the coordinates of M102 in his catalog, leading to confusion about the exact object they observed. In 1783, Machin retracted his discovery in a letter written to J. Bernoulli and claimed that M102 was actually an accidental duplication of M101 in the catalog. So later, um, if I remember right, it wasn't until what year somebody said, well, let's just use this for M102. Machine first observed, and Messier did not check the position. The 
According to Hogg, Machin discovered that the object designated as M102 is a duplicate observation of M101 and explained the error in a letter published in the Berliner Astronomische Jahrbuch, which contained a copy of Messier's supplement, an English translation of the relevant paragraph of the letter that reads on page 267 of the Connaissance des Temps for 1784, Mr. Mess Monsieur Messier lists under number 102 a nebula which I have discovered between Omicron Boothes and o Iota Draconis that is nothing but an error. This nebula is the same as the preceding 102. In the list of my nebula stars communicated to him, Ms. Monsieur Messier was confused due to an error in the sky chart. Um, the real puzzle is why this letter was overlooked for so long by astronomers. And not until Hogg published it in the Journal of Ro Royal Astronomical Society of Canada was the confusion regarding M102 cleared up. Messier's long career began to wane. Okay. So as a result, you just sort of have to pick a galaxy that we think Meshen meant to see, and the spindle galaxy might as well be it. Um, some dissension about which object was which, if any. But either way, the spindle galaxy is a worthy object to include. Edge on looks like a George Jetson car. Observation logged. The arc seconds, um, this is just six arc minutes wide. Oh, did I do it again? Sorry about that, Tiffany. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Yeah, so it looks a lot like a George Jetson car, doesn't it? Do, do, do. Okay, next we're going to M53. <laughs> He's beginning to zone. <laughs> Selected. M53. Near Como, Como Berenices. So now we're pretty much south of east. So it's east, southeast. And look, here's Virgo and Boetes and Coma Berenices, and it's right at the edge of this little triangle that is Coma Berenices. Looks like maybe a globular, huh? We haven't had a lot of globulars so far, have we? We got one now. It's nice. Snowball. 
Observation logged. Tiffany says, Sim dug some chocolate. <laughs> you guys, rumors of me zoning are a little bit exaggerated. <laughs> no, I'm fine so far. You guys are funny. Now, I wonder if we're in the zone now. Now, there are a lot of galaxies coming up. Um, okay, we'll keep stacking these as we go. Gotta be quick, like a bunny. Next is the Black Eye Galaxy. M64. Selected. Tiffany loves the globbies. <laughs> the globbies. Did you just make that up, Tiffany? Or you've been calling them globbies all the time? I don't think I've heard people call them globbies before. Okay, so we're inside of Coma Berenice's triangle now. So still east above Bootes. This black eye galaxy is also called Sleeping Beauty Galaxy. It's M64. Let me check down here under the object properties. Sure enough, black eye galaxy is in there twice. Let me grab that out of there. There you go. Evil eye galaxy. It's a relatively isolated spiral galaxy, 70 million light years away in the mildly northern constellation of Coma Berenices, discovered by Edward Pigeot in March 1779, and independently by Bode in April the same year, and by Charles Messier the next year. A dark band of absorbing dust partially in front of its bright nucleus, gave rise to its nicknames. It's inclined 60 degrees to the line of sight and has a position angle of 112 degrees. The interstellar medium of Messier 64 consists of two counter-rotating disks that are approximately equal in mass. Possible formation Scenarios include a merger with a gas-rich satellite galaxy in a retrograde orbit or the continued accretion of gas clouds from the intergalactic medium. You know, that word accretion, I think, means uh, where you're like drawing a bunch of stuff in there, ice and rocks, and you're beginning to coagulate those into particles that are bigger has a diameter of 53,800 light years, so about half the size of the Milky Way, maybe. Boy, it does look like a sleeping beauty or a black eye or a giant lizard that's about ready to wake up and be in a science fiction movie, doesn't it? That's what it is. King Kong meets Gon, Godzilla. Godzilla. King Kong meets Godzilla, and this is the Godzilla monster, and it's just waiting. I will get you. I will get you. Scary. But if you just think that that's some dust, and stop thinking about it as a giant lizard, then that's just the core of the galaxy covered up with some dust. So that's not scary, huh? Gerard says, winner to the M64 folks. Crank up some music.
globbies. Stu likes that name. Only eight hours to go, Tiffany. Stay strong. <laughs> Tiffany said she was just being goofy by saying globbies. More like let's play ball, scarecrow. Let's play ball. Twas brillig in the slithy toes, did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borough goes, and the lone grass out. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub-jub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the man's own foe he sought. So rested he by a tomb-tomb -tomb tree, and stood a while in thought. As in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock, with eyes of flame, came gurgling through the toggy wood, and gurgled as it came. One, two, one. To the borble blade went snicker-snack. He took its head beneath his arm and went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock, my son? O oh, frabjous day, kalu kalay! He chortled in his joy. This jabberwock poem is terrifying. <laughs> But anyway, that's a Lewis Carroll for you, and I think it was all about M64. And now I'm going to have nightmares. Uh, terrifying. Jabberwocky. Lewis Carroll stuff. Or just a galaxy with a big cloud of dust under its... <laughs> Larry said, I didn't expect a Lewis Carroll recital tonight. Observation log. Gerard, Doug, too many movies for you. Rolls eyes. Tiffany, impressive, Doug. I don't know. That's that's middle school, Tiffany. All right. On we go. Five minutes. M3 coming up. Selected. Okay, so M3 now we're we're below Coma Berenices, halfway over to Bootes, where Arcturus is. So still over that eastern horizon. This is another one of Tiffany's globbies. Another one of Tiffany's globbies. Wowed us from the first frame. Snowball. Green tint. <laughs> it's probably a little bit of green because of our observation log. Our thing that Frank mentioned about the bear filter deal. A globular cluster of the stars in the northern constellation of Canis Venetici, discovered May 3rd, 1764, was the first Messier object to be discovered by Charles Messier himself. Messier originally mistook the object for a nebula without stars. This mistake is corrected after the stars were resolved by William Herschel around 1784. Since then, it has become one of the best studied globular clusters. Many amateur astronomers consider it to be one of the finest northern globular clusters, followed only by Messier 13. This cluster is one of the largest and brightest, made up of around 500,000 stars. That's a half million. It is estimated to be 11.4 billion years old. It contains 274 known variables, by far the most found in any globby. Awesome.
Okay, so we gained a little time back on this. 80 seconds and we're out of the gate. Next is M98. Almost straight up. Selected. Thank you, Pete. Look at that. Right close to the meridian. And we're on the east side. So at any point, this could cross into the meridian. Let's be quick. This is a, an intermediate spiral about 44.4 million light years away in the Boy, it says that OBS disconnected and reconnected. Kevin, good to have you aboard. <laughs> Gerard says, any Shakespeare? Stu, I think he had too many astronomer steroids when he wrote that. Gerard, Stu, he dropped some funny drink into his thermos. Stu was well known for opium. Oh boy. Lewis Carroll was known for opium? Yikes. Wow, it's a beautiful spiral, isn't it? This is M98. Selected. Gorgeous. Forty four million light years away. Approaching us. Near edge on. Phenomenal stuff. Our universe, huh? Okay, two for one special coming up. We slew to Hipparchus 60198, and that lines us up for seeing both M99 and M100. Oh, we lost our scope cam, didn't we? That's sad. Hmm. Let's see. Let's go close this and then reopen it. And then maybe, maybe it's just as well as we leave it closed because Maybe that's one of the things that causes us to have latency. That'll mean we're not going to see the scope for a while, but we can see the sky cam view, and that'll at least show us movement. So let's let the scope cam 
die out for a minute and see if that does away with the latency. Okay, so what are we looking at here? M99 and M100. Selected. M99. M100. This is also right at the meridian right now. It's above Virgo. So the M99 side has the bright star close to it. That would be this, I think. M99 must be here. Let's verify that real quick. Yes. So M99 has these loose arms. Look at that. Almost reminds you of M51, doesn't it? It's sometimes called the Virgo cluster pinwheel or the coma pinwheel. A grand design spiral discovered by Michin. It's one of the first galaxies in which a spiral pattern was seen. And that was identified by Lord Rossi in the spring of 46. It's definitely interacted with something, huh? Maybe this, which is M100. Look at M100's loose arms. Grand Design Intermediate, one of the brightest and largest galaxies in the Virgo cluster. Its diameter is 107,000 light years, so kind of similar to the Milky Way. Actually, two tightly wound spiral arms attached to a small nucleus, 1,000 parsecs, where star formation has been taking place for at least 500 million years in separate bursts. Yeah, that's that telltale sign. All those, all those little whitish, bluish nebulae, they're in those arms. And then here's the one that's tightly wound, but it fans out wide. That's almost 200% of our sensor, so we're out into the, definitely into the pixelation of it. They're kind of uneven. If you stop and think about it, in a way, this one almost reminds you of a coiled snake ready to strike. We could see the effects of tidal TIDAL interactions, M100 had an arm that looked like it had been a coiled snake ready to start, strike. We could see the um, star forming regions after just five minutes. It's really a beautiful galaxy, huh? Observations for three objects logged. One of those is the pointer star. Okay, next is M85. So looking at the sky cam, have we stopped? Yes.
M85. Selected. This is a lenticular galaxy. And I always wonder, how do you explain what is a lenticular? And the only way I know how to explain what a lenticular galaxy is, is it's basically a spiral galaxy with no spirals. <laughs> so in other words, it's basically the core of a galaxy whose spiral arms have been ripped off, maybe. Anyway, that's one way to think of it. M85 is a lenticular galaxy, or elliptical for other authors, 61 million light years away, and it's estimated 125,000 light years across. Pierre Machine discovered it, 1781. It's within the outskirts of the Virgo cluster, but relatively isolated. Extremely poor in neutral hydrogen. Has very complex outer structure with shells and ripples that are thought to have been caused by a merger with another galaxy that took place between four and seven billion years ago. Now, how do they know that? As well as a relatively young, three billion year old stellar population on its centermost region, some of it in a ring that may have been created by a late starburst. So maybe, can we see that ring? That's 100%. All we see is the blob. M85 is interacting with nearby spiral galaxy NGC 4394 and a small galaxy called MCG 3-32-38. It's low on x-rays. Huh. This one's a little spiral, isn't it? <laughs> Gerard said this looked like a fat elliptical galaxy, and Stu said you have to call them plus-sized now. S Tiffany can't keep up with the politically correct vocabulary. The scope cam dropped. I think it might have happened a while ago when we had too much latency going on. And you're right, Stu. I, I think we should try to leave it off in case that's what's causing the lag. Tiffany says, now we're going to have to talk about blobby globbies. Tiffany, what are we going to do with you? Oh, there is less latency now. Look at that. Compared to the way we were a while ago, it's snappy. This blob is fat or plus sized, depending on whether you ask Gerard or Stu. Um, no arms. Okay, so observation log. Stu says he hasn't noticed any more lag, so maybe we're getting to the bottom of this. Larry's broke out, broken out another song. This blob's for you. Okay, so the next object is M84 and M86. Now to get there, we actually point at NGC 4435, because it gives us both objects in the same frame. So now we're in the Markarian's chain. Selected. And you guys that have been with us before, 
you know what Markarian's chain is. It's uh, this chain of objects. Oh my goodness, we're right on the meridian. Look at that. Look at the meridian. It's sneaking across us. This is going to be problems. Yikes. When that meridian crosses the location of our telescope, we're going to have difficulties, folks. And we don't have a scope cam. Wait, maybe I can look at it on my little phone here. I can. This is a poor man's scope cam. So I don't know how long it's going to take before it decides to do a meridian flip. But I'll sort of keep an eye on it there. Anyway, my car has chain. It's looking beautiful, isn't it? Look at this. You know, we just simply have to look at this in deep sky image annotation. Okay, so M80. Four is here. M86 is here. And for our purposes tonight, that's all we got to worry about. M84 is in the top and then M86. So let's turn all this other stuff off and it just becomes backdrop. M84, M86. Two blobs. M84 is a giant elliptical or lenticular. Um... Messier discovered it in 1781. It's in the heavily populated core of Virgo cluster of galaxies, part of the local supercluster. Oh, it's meridian flipping. This means we're going to stop and just snap a picture. Because all of that live stacking is gone. So memorize what that looks like, folks. That's the best view we'll have of it. Um, a visible galaxy surrounded by massive dark matter halo. Radio observations and Hubble Space Telescope images have revealed two jets of matter shooting out from its center as well as a disk of rapidly rotating gas and stars indicating the presence of a huge supermassive black hole. Oh my goodness. You know what? We need to go back and look at this again, right? M84? Is this the one with the spur? Frank, are you still with us? The telescope will turn into a helicopter. <laughs> you guys, you have a regular... Saturday Night Live comedy routine going on over here. <laughs> I'm not even going to try to explain it on the microphone. <laughs> um, we have to go back because isn't M84 the one with the jet? Oh my goodness, now we're upside down. So it's this one. Isn't it, Frank? Are you still with us, Frank? M86, it says elliptical or lenticular, discovered by Messier, heart of the Virgo cluster, conspicuous group with another large galaxy, M84, displays the highest blue shift of all Messier objects, as it is 
net of its other vectors of travel approaching the Milky Way at 244 kilometers per second. Yikes, it's going to collide with us someday. This is due to both galaxies falling roughly towards the center of the Virgo cluster and from opposing ends, undergoing profound changes from interactions with other galaxies, including process known as ram pressures stripping rich array array of globular clusters. Whew. Curtis, you're right. That's M87, isn't it? Okay, so we won't spend as long on this anyway. Thanks, Curtis. So anyway, M84 here, M86 there. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. So let's do our quick observation. Two blobs in the Markarian chain. Observations for three objects log. And M87 is next. Curtis, thanks for pitching in. Have we stopped moving? Yes. Selected. Okay, for context sake, we're still within the arms of Virgo. See? Here are her arms, and here are her legs. She's saying, M87, I love you. We're on the west side of the meridian, thankfully. Look at all these galaxies. There's a Markarian chain. I couldn't get this M87 in the same field of view as M84 and M86. It's just one of them got left out no matter what. Excuse me. <laughs> you guys are getting giddy now. Okay, so here is M87. Now look what you can already see right here. After 40 seconds, let me just pause for a second. Lord, thank you so much for a Rasa 11 and a ZWASI 2600 MC Pro. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Because look, after 40 seconds, we can already see that spur. And it's sticking out right here after 40 seconds. Now, granted, the spur is 5,000 light years out. 5,000 light years, granted, but this M87 is far away. It's 53 million light years away. So imagine at a distance of 53 million light years, being able to see a 5,000 light year spur on the side of this galaxy. And right there it is. Now it's very tiny. But we notice this spur after 20 seconds, and it gets better with every single exposure. This is 120 seconds. Now to give this spur some meaning, let's go out here for a second. And let's say M87 wiki. Sorry for the bright lights. Yikes, it's really bright. Folks, that jet that you see sticking out of M87, almost in our direction, but not quite, thankfully, that jet is 5,000 light years long. But what's even more amazing is, 
We can see it. We can see that jet. Now what this is, is some kind of a giant stream of material being jettisoned out of that black hole. They call it a relativistic jet. It's like the, what you call it, drill in Star Wars. Right? A supergiant elliptical galaxy in the constellation Virgo that contains several trillion stars. Trillion, with a T like Tango. One of the largest and most massive galaxies in the local universe. It has a large population of globular clusters, or as Tiff would say, Globby, what was your phrase again? Something globby. Um, 15,000 globulars compared to 150 to 200 orbiting the Milky Way. And a jet of energetic plasma that originates at the core and extends at least 4,900 light years, traveling at a relativistic speed. What that means is, it's traveling like almost at the speed of light, so much so that you wonder, is it slowed down in slow motion because of Einstein's theory of relativity? Woohoo! Uh, it is one of the brightest radio sources in the sky. Messier had discovered M87 in 1781, and he did not see the relativistic jet, and cataloged it as a nebula. It is 53 million light years from Earth and is the second brightest galaxy within the Northern Virgo, Northern Virgo Cluster, having many satellites, no distinctive dust lanes, and almost featureless, ellipsoidal shape, typical of most giant elliptical galaxies, diminishing in luminosity with the distance from the center of the core. It has an active supermassive black hole at its core, which forms the primary component of an active galactic nucleus. The black hole was imaged using data collected in 2017 by the Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT, with a final processed image released 10th of April 2019. Can you see the jet? This looks like a little spur. That is so cool. Tiffany says, oh my goodness, Doug, that is so cool. <laughs> Gerard says, incredible. Stu, that is the Enterprise phasers firing on the Romulans. Yes! Gerard, Tiffany, coming out the ears. Those pesky Romulans. Tiffany says, Doug, totally amazing. Oh, I'm so glad you think so, Tiffany, because I think so too. <laughs> you guys, you are getting giddy. Okay, it's six minutes. we got to move on because it is messy, a marathon night. I'm just going to save this, even though in the saved version, it won't look like this. It's going to be so tiny because, look, it goes back out to look like that. Anyway, thanks for close-ups. How do we sum this up in an observation? We literally saw that spur, the 5,000 light year relativistic jet after 20 seconds. Wow, amazing. Observation log. Let's go to PGC 41907 which is going to give us a three-for-one special. M89, M90, and M91. I got to say, you got to scout out your field of view for these objects in advance and you have to pick what pointing star you're going to use so you can get as many of these things in one field of view as possible 
if you want these two for one, three for one specials. And I have uploaded this Astro Planner document to the Astro Planner collective, whatever you call it. And that way other people can now download it with all of these pointer stars as long as they have a field of view that's similar to this Ross 11's, um, then they can take advantage of the same, the same stuff. And Gerard wants to know if we can observe Voyager. You guys are, you guys are d definitely staying up too late. Is it really 1:20? Yikes. Okay. Selected. So for context. My goodness, we're right below Makarian's chain. And we're going to look for M89, M90, and M91. And the way we'll find them is they will be in a satellite dish facing upward kind of formation. 89, 90, 91. 91 is across to the left. Oh, so look, it's upside down. 89, 90. So is this 45, 60? Is that 45, 71? Maybe it's... Thank you, Robin Glover, for deep sky image annotation. M89 is on the left. M90 is here, and M91 is over here. So 89, 90, 91. And then look at all these other objects that we don't have time to look at tonight, sadly. 89, 90, 91. So first, 89. Looks like a lenticular, right? Yeah, lenticular or elliptical, whichever. Discovered by Messier. Surrounding structure of gas and dust. 150,000 light years. Jets of heated particles. Up to two thirds of that. Wow. It may have once been an active quasar, a radio galaxy. Extensive and complex system of surrounding shells and plumes, indicating that it has seen one or several notable mergers. That's pretty good tuning. I don't think we can improve on that. So let's. I'm at 220%. <laughs> Let's go out here real quick and look for M89, just fast, just as quickly as we can. M89 wiki. That's it. That's pretty much what we see. Wow. So bright core, but you can't see any of those jets. You just see like a a nebulous core around it. And that's what we're seeing. Just a bright core, slightly oval shaped in our picture. Huh. Maybe that's because he's at the edge, who knows? 
Okay, now let's back off and look for M90. Pretty spiral. Look at that. We're seeing an inner set of arms here separated by dust lanes and an outer set of arms here. Really bright core. In fact, there's an inner an inner larger core here. Wow. An intermediate spiral exhibiting a weak inner ring structure about 60 million light years away, discovered by Messier. It has lost much of its interstellar medium. Ram pressure stripping. It appears severely truncated. There are even H2 regions outside the galaxy's plane, as well as long 260,000 light year trails of ionized gas that have been stripped away. Fascinating, huh? It's beautiful. <laughs> you guys are over here talking about TV shows. Definitely too late for you guys. <laughs> and then our M91 was here, right? Or was it here? Here. Oh, look, it's got a kind of a um, bar. It's got a bar, and then it's got an inner arm that slings these way up. And this arm is farther than this arm. So that's 91. A barred spiral is found in the south of Cone Veronese. Um, 63 million light years away, it was the last of a group of eight nebulae, quote nebulae, term galaxy only come into use for these objects once it was realized in the 20th century that they were extragalactic. Discovered by Charles Messier in 1781, it's the faintest object in the Messier catalog. Boy. Thank you, Rasa11, because this doesn't look at all faint. Um... There was a bookkeeping error by Messier, and for a long time, it was missing. It didn't match any known object. And in 1969, the amateur astronomer William C. Williams realized that NGC 4548 was exactly five degrees the wrong direction, right ascension and declination, that made it exactly match up with Messier's numbers. Point 0.1 of an arc minute in right ascension and one degree in declination. That's fairly complex. Bravo to William C. Williams who noticed that, right? And bravo to Messier for finding this, this faint galaxy from Paris. Whew. Well, that's eight minutes, but we did three objects, right? Uh, quick observation. 89 was an interesting blob with lots of glow. 90 was a cool spiral, but 91, the missing object, was even cooler. We could see 
the bar early on rings out of alignment. Observations for four objects log. Tiffany says, I love the spiral galaxies, and this one sure is pretty. Gerard, the Ross 11 performs like a 32 inch daub. That's what the guy in charge of Sky Tools 4 told me that we had to do. He said, if you're using EAA with the Ross 11, just put it on 32 inch daub. And even then, it wasn't quite matching what this thing would do. So I got to say, I, I like EAA. OK, we're back to reality here. Headed to M88. Selected. Okay, so M88 is still in this part that Gerard really wanted to see, the Virgo cluster. Look at all this. Wow, galaxies everywhere, as far as the eye can see. Galaxies opens and globs, oh my. Galaxies opens and globs, oh my. This is a nice spiral, isn't it? M88. So for context, it's in the same place where we've been. Still in Virgo's arms. Back we go. Ooh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why did that livestock not clear? There it goes. I'm almost out of water. Well, we're doing the messy object chart. <laughs> we can't show all those other ones. <laughs> You're wild. We're going to try to make it through the messy objects. It is as beautiful, isn't it, Tiffany? It's kind of in a neat. Quite a bit of noise so far, but that's just 60 seconds. This Virgo cluster is crazy, filled with all kinds of stuff, but especially all these wild galaxies. This one is pitched just right to show off its arms and face. Observation log. Man. You know, here's the thing, guys. That's just so hard to imagine that that happened by accident. It's just, you know what? Here's my conclusion after looking at M88. I don't have enough faith in chance to think that this happened by accident. That's my conclusion. Observation log. I don't have enough faith and chance to think that that could have happened accidentally.
something or someone because that's just too cool All right, on to M58. Has the mount settled? The sequence asks me this every time. Yes, I think it's settled. Selected. M58. Okay, we snuck out of the Virgo heart. No, we didn't. We're still in it. I just want to say so many galaxies. So many. So, period, many, period, galaxies, period. Um, is this M58 here in the middle? Because look, those are cool down there. Is that the thing you call the antennae galaxies? Boy, Robin, your sharp solve is so fast. No, butterfly galaxies. NGC 4568. Anyway, this is M58 here in the middle. That's what we're supposed to be looking at. See the butterfly? <laughs> That's pretty cool, isn't it? It's like they're kissing. Two kissing galaxies. But the one we're supposed to look at is right here. Oh yeah, look at the bar. You know, with all these bars, it's a wonder that this doesn't get rated so the kids can't watch it. You know, you gotta be 18 to go into this live stream. With all these bars. M58. Barred. Intermediate barred spiral with a weak inner ring structure, 68 million light years away, discovered by Messier, April 15, 1779. One of four barred spirals that are in his catalog. It's one of the brightest galaxies in the Virgo cluster. And back in 1779, it was the farthest known object. Sixty-eight million, sixty-eight million light years away. That's so crazy. Remember the last one we, we did our little talk about far distances. <clears throat> that one was between thirty and ninety. This is still far. That's crazy far. Next is a two for one special. And we slew to M59 to be able to see M59 and M60. And it looks like we stopped. Selected. Pete, I'm telling you, I noticed myself going to Stellarium a lot more because it's so fast. 
to use your control panel. I just, I'm just getting this workflow now, you know, doing everything in a certain order and your panel makes it so easy to go here. Okay, so you see where we are. We're still in that Virgo cluster. This lady still got her arms up saying, this is amazing. Look at all these, right? <laughs> you guys have so many, so many side conversations. I just want to look at you that are watching this recording and tell you, these guys that are live, they are going to go and meet somewhere. I'm serious. They're going to go meet. And you and I will be left here doing astronomy while they eat fresh eggs and thick cut breakfast meats. And we're going to be left here alone. <laughs> you guys. Okay, so here we are. Right smack in the middle is M59. Look at all this other stuff that he didn't find. I'm not disrespecting him. There's got to be a reason that he didn't find this brighter galaxy over here. He found this, I'm not complaining, but why didn't he notice that? Anyway, here we are. M59, now where is M16? Maybe I spoke too soon. That's M60. All apologies, fault was mine. Charles, you and I are buds. We're okay. This is M60. This is M59. Okay, so M59, it's elliptical, supermassive black hole, abbreviated SMBH, a mass that has been estimated at 270 million times the mass of the sun. And that's just the black hole. It kind of rotates. And it's bluer. It is a bright looking core, isn't it? So let's memorize. Every time it's a bright core, it's got to be a supermassive black hole. <laughs> Probably almost. This is M60, elliptical. 57 million light years away. It forms that pair with NGC 4647 and makes a pair known as ARP 116. These both were discovered by Gott, Johann Gottfried Kohler in April 79. He was observing a comet in the same part of the sky and these kept getting in the way. By the way, that black hole in M60, oh wait, the black hole in this is one of the largest ever found and it's currently inactive. It's 4.5 billion solar masses. These super massive black holes scare me to death. 4.5 billion solar masses just in the black hole alone. What do you guys think about? <laughs> you guys are still <laughs> talking about having dark chocolate after your breakfast. What have we created? <laughs> Both M59 and M60 have SMBH, but 
the M59 lock hole is inactive. Oh, and M60 is inactive. Man, how do they know this? Did they like listen to it or something? Observations, Observations for, for two, two objects, objects logged. logged. How do you tell a black hole's inactive? Do you like try to throw something into it and it just hangs? Or what? Here we go to M49. So see, I go over here and I put in the name and I click OK. And then I click Stellarium Sync. Selected. By that time, the telescope is sometimes still then I go over to Stellarium, and it's already there because of UP. M49, still in that same Virgo lady's arms. Still. Okay, we can't quite see everything. But we're getting closer. Right there in the middle. Well, it looks like we still had movement going on when it did its first frame. So it probably wasn't still. <laughs> when I answered, is it still, it wasn't. <laughs> but you get the idea. It's another one of those ellipticals. A giant elliptical galaxy about 56 million light years away in the equatorial constellation of Virgo, discovered by Messier, 1777. It has the physical form of a radio galaxy, but it only has the radio emission of a normal galaxy. This galaxy has many globular clusters, Tiffany. Estimated to be 5,900. This is far more than the 200 that are orbiting the Milky Way. But fewer than the M87 galaxy has. On, Alex, on average, we think these globular clusters have the apparent age of 10 billion years. Tiffany, nightmares about black holes. <laughs> Larry, I might be able to do this in theoretical medical max, maximum mass for them. So is Gerard leaving? Yep, lots of glo globbies. What was your phrase for lots of globbies, Tiffany? I forget. So many globbies. To quote Tiffany in this M forty nine galaxy, fifty nine hundred. Count them. Observation log. Next comes M61. See, it's moving there. Now it's steady. Oh, Gerard, an early morning Sunday. Totally understand. Respect that. Besides, someday, if you want, you can always play the rest of the video. Start at this point and play the rest. 
Not that you would have to do that, but. Selected. This is M49. Still in Virgo. Wow. Nope, this is M61, sorry. M61, the swelling spiral. Yes, I did see that, Curtis. Curtis is writing about Kerr, K-E-R-R, -R, who saw Einstein's uh, GR, was that general relativity equations for a rotating body, and he published a paper recently saying that singularities are not required and that Hawking and Penrose were wrong. So nothing to be scared of. They follow understood physics. Yes, thank you, Curtis. I feel better. Kevin Gilchrist, thanks for lurking. Glad you're getting some image in. Half hour M106, and now moving to M109. Cool. Totally understand, Gerard. Stu, a fellow lurker, saying hi to Kevin, a fellow lurker. <laughs> All right, so we're still in the Virgo lady's arms. It does look like a swelling spiral. Look at that. That's just weird, isn't it? These almost look like they're in lines. Look at that. It's like this is a hexagon. You know what? I think this is a message from another species. Look, that's a square line. And that's a straight line. And that's a straight line. And this is a straight line. Now I ask you, how did those become straight lines? Doesn't make sense. I wonder if my microphone's back. 152. I bet it's charged. Okay. Now go down here. What if I just click that? No. You gotta click here and then click here and then choose this drop down and make it that. And then click OK. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, back with the wireless mic. <clears throat> uh, isn't this an uncanny looking galaxy? I don't remember seeing this one before. How have we not seen this? Look at that. <clears throat> it says it's uh, discovered by Oriani, Barnaba Oriani, 1779. And then six days later, Messier discovered it again. In fact, Messier discovered in his journal he had observed it the same night as Oriani, but he had mistaken it for a comet. Eight extragalactic supernovae have so far been observed here, making it one of the the most prodigious galaxies for such cataclysmic events. <clears throat> this M61 is crazy the way the spiral arms look so straightened out in some sections. 
Observation log. Tiffany says loud and clear. That guy looks like it could be mounted as jewelry, Tiffany says. You're right. It's the jewelry galaxy. The jewelry galaxy. Observation log. Finally, as soon as Gerard leaves, we get to his M104. This is what he was wanting to see. Can you see the scope? Takes it a while to settle. You can't get in too big of a hurry. Selected. Thanks, Pete. Oh, we're finally outside the girl's arms. Look, now we're kind of over in between Virgo and Corvus, which I think is the crow. We're in between these two now. Finally. Woohoo! It's a good sign, guys. Now let's see if we're now able to get it all in one. Nope, still can't fit it in one scene. Oh my goodness, look at this. Gerard was right. Isn't it beautiful? All right, let's take a little bit off these mids because this is a little bit different. In fact, I'm going to do a um, restretch and a recolor balance here because something changed up here. There, that's beautiful. So it's called the Sombrero Galaxy. Well, I still, look, there's still movement. I must have still, something happened to jiggle it. Sorry about that, but we can still see it for Messier Marathon night. It's beautiful, isn't it? It looks like a sombrero. It's kind of that Hamburger Galaxy effect, isn't it? It lost its lightsaber duel and got arms chopped off. <laughs> That's good. That's about M61. Pretty cool. Reminds us of the hamburger galaxy in that it has that dust lane bisecting the uh, edge on effect. A peculiar galaxy of unclear classification. Bright nucleus, unusually large central bulge, prominent dust lane, viewed almost edge on, Give it appearance of a sombrero hat, it's thus, thus its name. Astronomers initially thought the halo was small and light, indicative of a spiral galaxy, but the Spitzer Space Telescope found that the dust ring was larger and more massive than previously thought, indicative of a giant elliptical galaxy. Well, there you Observation go. Observation log. M68 is next, gang. M68. Selected. Ricky made his mom a piece of jewelry that had a galaxy image in it. You guys are great to stay up all night like this. It's 2 a.m. 
Did I mean, is Gerard the only one that realizes that? You guys have been staying up all night. This is crazy. Except for Stu. He's sipping coffee on the deck outside of the house. In the afternoon. Because he's in Tuaranga, New Zealand. <laughs> Stu. Tuaranga. It always sounds a little bit more. Yes, you're right. Numbers are dropping, but the faithful are here. Larry's got to travel tomorrow. Not too much longer. Well, Larry, you've done well. Oh, my goodness. Look at this glob. It's a beautiful glob. There you go, Tiffany. It's in the southeast of Hydra, away from its precisely equatorial part. It's discovered by Messier in 1780. So again, here we are in Hydra. Hail Hydra. Uh, it's south, southwest now. Here's the um, horizon. This is at 24 degrees. How did this happen? Okay. So, um, cool glob. Observation log. M83 is next. The southern pinwheel. I see. A lot of the rest of these are now just rising. It's a good thing, isn't it? It's very cool. Uh, we must still be spinning. We are spinning. I can see it in the poor man's scope cam. It's still spinning. Now what it's doing is it's rotating down. There we go. Selected. Southern pinwheel. M83. Oh, wow, we're back uh, east of the meridian again. So this is almost due south. Only 11 p.m. in California. We're 22 degrees up here. Boy, that's messy looking, isn't it? What in the world? Look at how we have slightly egg-shaped stars. This is bothering me. I wonder if we need to go back Think we should go back to the zero mark? 
and kind of sort of restart. Look at that. That's odd, isn't it? It's like the mount has gotten out of sync with itself. What a messy looking galaxy. Is this the way it really looks? Yeah, look at that. That is the biggest mess ever. Such a messy looking galaxy. It says it's 15 million light years away. Nicolas Luis de la Caille discovered it on 23rd of February 1752 at the Cape of Good Hope. It's one of the closest and brightest barred spirals in the sky. Massive, grand design spiral. The peculiar dwarf galaxy NGC 5253 lies near it, and the two likely interacted, resulting in all the starburst activity in their central region. Apparently from the interaction with NGC 5253. Observation log. Here's 5253, way over here. But I guess they're near each other in relative terms. Boy, how messy is that? Next is M5. Yeah, still cotton candy looking. You're right. What do they call that? I think it's called flocking sometimes, or flock, flocculent. Flaculent, I think. It's as nice as a glob. Beautiful icicle glob. Looks like Christmas. Observation log. Now I wonder if we stop. Yeah. Oh my goodness, look how beautiful. The truth is, we wouldn't have appreciated that fully. Boy, it's hard to get the color balance on this. It must have different colored stars or something. There it goes. It took forever to get that color balanced. This is discovered by Kirch in 1702. It has two pulsars that flash every millisecond. Hmm. I wonder what the temperature is now. 41. Probably we could do with refocusing sometime. Now in terms of this sequence, let's just Turn it off for a minute. Um, let's see, what is that called? It's called um, 
So that exposure to three seconds, that's what it's called. And then it just turns things off. And now let's just go to Hercules Live without using the normal Selected. So this is M13, and this is the finest globular in the sky. So look how it's back in the east. So it's east northeast. And you know, this Hercules keystone, we're just right above it. If this is his archery bow and arrow deal, then I guess we got to turn our head sideways and it's we're at, on his backpack. So there it is. I mean, we don't have to plate solve it. It's just beautiful, isn't it? And I suppose a longer exposure would yield even more beautiful results. Yeah, let's do it real quick. Um, what is that called? Prep for imaging only? M13. Curtis is out of here. See you, Curtis. Thanks for spending time with us, man. You go way back to 2021 as well. Tiffany, I'm mainly doing this for you, since you're the globular princess. This is so weird down here. There it is. <laughs> it just took it a while to. Wow. So M13, several hundred thousand stars discovered by Edmund Haley in 1714. 23 arc minutes, readily viewable. Compared to the stars in the neighborhood of the sun, the stars in M13 are more than a hundred times more densely packed. So close together, they sometimes collide and produce new stars. The young, excuse me, the newly formed young stars are called blue stragglers. Particularly interesting. The 1974 Arecibo message which contained encoded information about the human race, DNA, atomic numbers, Earth position, and other information, was beamed from the Arecibo Observatory radio telescope toward Messier 13 as an experiment in contacting potential extraterrestrial civilizations in the cluster. How about that? It is a bit mesmerizing, isn't it? So huge. Several hundred thousand stars. Observation log. Next is M92. Another glob. I like this. We're making good progress, gang. Right? 
Right there it is. M92. Selected. This is still in Hercules, but look, we were in his backpack. Now we're behind his right kneecap. Discovered by Johan Elert Bode, published in the Berliner Astronomische Jahrbuch, 1779. Messier rediscovered it. Herschel first resolved it into individual stars. It's one of the brighter of its sort in apparent magnitude in the northern, northern hemisphere and in absolute magnitude as well. I guess these globulars, they rotate around the whole core, not just in the disk of the Milky Way. So at any one time, they can be out, way out into interstellar space, not inside the disk. Observation log. Okay, let's slew to the ring nebula M57. I think we're going to want to plate solve this one. Selected. Right there it is. So we don't need to plate solve it, we can just go straight to imaging. Um, prep for imaging only. M57. The Ring Nebula. <laughs> Tiffany. Wow. Wow, wow. <laughs> That's funny. This Ring Nebula is a planetary in Lyra talks about that its last stages of evolution before becoming a white dwarf expels a vast luminous envelope of ionized gas into the surrounding interstellar space discovered by Messier in late January 1779. Our focus is not one of our better focus, but if you use your imagination, you can just barely see the uh, central star in this. But wow, we've lost our focus, haven't we? That's 95%. And look at that. I wonder if we can focus here with the ring nebula in our view, if that would mess us up. Let's stop live stacking for a second and go focus. Any self-respecting astronomer would want to focus better than that. I know we're supposed to be in a hurry on messy a marathon night. I wonder if the ring nebula is going to mess up our focus. We're going to find out. Okay, how about something like a cracker? I'm going to mute so I don't chew the cracker in your ear. That didn't mute.
the good news is, <clears throat> oh my, that is not a good looking parabola at all. So now we know the, the ring nebula is messing us up. The good news is I found some orange chocolate out on the counter. The bad news is I can't share it. Graham, are you the Graham from Sky Searchers? You're like the moderator, right? Whoa, this is a really big deal. Are you this Graham from Sky Searchers? I feel like I should like salute. Wow. Thanks for stopping by, man. That's the most horrible parabola I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> FedEx. <laughs> oh no, do you think it could be high clouds? Oh no. Please say no. No, it doesn't look cloudy. I wonder if... Sure is terrible, isn't it? Rats. Oh, what are options? Let's do this. Let's go back to zero. Start again. Boy, that orange chocolate thing was good. I don't think those other orange slices are going to last very long out there. Who put those on the countertop to tempt me? This uh, <clears throat> Don Mackholtz tells the story of how the Messier Marathon got started. <clears throat> he says <clears throat> he 
He says he realized in the late 1960s that practically all of the Messier objects could be seen in one night. But he didn't really further investigate it until 1978, summer. And in that, excuse me, that September, <clears throat> he wrote an article for the San Jose Astronomical Association newsletter called Messier Marathons. That's September 1978. Remember that date. <clears throat> and he invited members of the club to join him the following March on Loma Prieta Mountain, which was his normal common hunting site. <clears throat> so over the next few works, over the next few months, he worked out the observing order, the search sequence, and he used atlases, used star charts. This is 1978, so there weren't, were there? No, there weren't computers. We didn't get personal computers till 1980. Two, largely. So, then, in March 79, he got an issue of Sky and Telescope, and the columnist Walter Scott Houston included in his Deep Sky Wonders column an article about a Messier Marathon. And he said amateur astronomers in Pittsburgh were doing it and said they'd started in 77. Tom Huffelder, Ed Flynn, Tom Ryland, and they all had found large number of messy objects March and April of 77. So he got scooped. Um, <clears throat> However, they didn't find M30. And the record that any of them had found so far was 103. That was the first time he'd seen an article like that. So, he also heard of a group in Southern California that was doing this. Oh, Tiffany says Loma Prieta is a 20 minute drive from her house. Well, this is still a weird parabola, but it's better than the last one. Right? Um, so then he tells about the Pittsburgh group. Nobody had ever done all 110. So they, in 79, started doing it. And during the following year, he lectured on it a lot. He wrote articles for Astronomy Magazine about it. He determined different sites where he might be able to find M30. But still in 1980, he only did 109. M30 was the tough one. More locations. Ah, and then in 1985, the first guy found the whole night with M30. So it was 1985, the first time anybody did it. And then he goes on and talks about other stuff. Well, what happened to the parabola? It's gone. Well, I'm going to assume it was better, right? You guys might have seen it. Was it better? Do you know the way to San Jose? Suspense. Ah, uh, that's more like it, isn't it? 
Yes. Not perfect. But that's 200% too. We're just in a dark part of the sky. Okay, now let's uh, enable tracking again and go back to where we were. Larry, understand, brother. You got to take off. Catch the rest on the save video. <laughs> Good night, Tiffany and all. It's like Tiffany is the room hostess. <laughs> okay, here we are. Now let's do a plate solve since we're here. Correct this. Okay, now let's go back to live stacking. Prep for imaging only. <clears throat> M57. Selected. So now we're in Lyra, kind of that little parallelogram deal, near Vega. And as far as our direction, it's east-northeast. That's uh, better. Now you can see the central star without using your imagination as much. This is 150%, so we're somewhat into the digital zoom. But even after 60 seconds, you can see the central star already. Notice how we've got green in the middle, and then we've got like a brighter kind of whitish green, and then the outer again is the red shell. Had to focus, had to refocus first. Could see the central star in this planetary, as well as greens and reds and everything in between after just 100 seconds. Observation log. Let's just uh, set exposure to three seconds. Now we're at uh, M56. Selected. And now we're below Lyra. So here, and we're at east-northeast still. Now this is a very dim globular, isn't it? We're still getting a little bit of rotation. That's weird, isn't it? It's almost like I feel like what? 
could be causing that, just a little bit of odd rotation. So that's just a three second exposure, but you can see the glob, huh? We might count that for the sake of this. We could observe this with just three second images. Observation logged. The next one is called the cooling tower. It's M29. <laughs> Tiffany says, I adore you guys. EA is such a treat for me. I only have an old 10 inch daub that's knobs and dials. It's as tall as me in the stand and really heavy. This is such a treat. It's a treat for us to have you here, by the way. Stu, all these objects deserve at least hours of stacking for our viewing pleasure, but I'm enjoying the rush too. <laughs> uh, you think we're in the right place? Maybe this is a, uh, yeah, this is an open cluster. So we're assuming it's, yeah, look right here. Look, you can see that it has the cooling tower look to it. Like, like one of those cooling towers beside a, a manufacturing plant, right? We could instantly see the cooling tower asterism. Not as many stars in this cluster. Let's see what they say about it. A quite small but bright open cluster discovered by Messier in 1764, about 10 million years old, not sure how far away it is, maybe 5,800 light years. Observation logged. Okay, let's go to M39, another open cluster. Really flying through tonight. Stu says, only marathon I'll ever do. <laughs> Ricky says, yeah, this is pretty sick. <laughs> Stu says, I could probably do a buffet marathon. <laughs> okay, we're kind of close in on this, aren't we? Look at that. Let's play it solid to be sure. Since Robin's plate solve is so fast. Yep, that's it. And it says, an open cluster of stars in constellation Cygnus, positioned two degrees south of the star Pi Cygnum. Cluster is covered by Guillaume Le Gentil in 1749. And that's it. It's just what? 30 stars. Only 30 stars or so. Observation logged. Now the next one we'll want to stack, I bet, it's M27. And it's just 15 degrees. So these just rose, M27 just rose at 1.18 a.m. So in other words, about 90 minutes ago. So we're getting to these early. I think I can see it right there, but let's play it solve. I think it's right here. Selected. Yeah, look how low we are now in the eastern horizon. Just right above the treetops. Now, see how everything else we've been looking at with just three second exposures, it's at least showing up. But look how M27 is just like a ghostly shadow. In fact, you can just barely, barely detect that there's something there. If you, if you didn't look for it, you might not even notice it. So we have to live stack this. Let's go, it's called Prep for Imaging Only. 
It's M27. This runs so much faster without that scope cam deal. That's been the problem. Because that's being mirrored into the laptop, it must use up so many MIPS. Look at that first 20 second exposure. Wow. Now let's reset all this. Uh, the amazing thing is we can see the central star here too. See it right there, the central star? It truly does look like an apple core, doesn't it? Got your reds out here after just 60 seconds. Got your reds out here, your greens here in the middle, and look, it's another example of the way that lobe shows up in the east-west, in other words, the 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock position. There's a certain greenish tinge that shows up in those east-west poles, if you can call them that. It's called M27, the Dumbbell Nebula, or the Apple Core, the Diablo, the Double-Headed Shot Nebula. It's in Volpecula, the first such nebula to be discovered, Charles Messier in 1764 a prolate spheroid. Expanding at no more than 2.3 arc seconds per century. So it will only last for another 1,460 years. We figure it's 9,800 years old. Selected. So again, we're right on the treetops, and we're above the east-northeast azimuth. I think this is a fascinating looking object, isn't it? Tiffany says, lovely object, Doug. You know, these big objects are really eye candy, aren't they? We've been for months, we've been going after these exotic things that are just very tiny. So these represent amazing sights for us, don't they? Two minutes and 40 seconds, let's call it. That's amazing. So relatively remarkable compared to the small targets we've been looking at for so long. Now we go back to a lot of globs in a row. So let's go just back to set exposure to three seconds. And maybe let's go with four seconds. Oh, I didn't do a quick observation for clear apple core look after just 100 seconds. Saw the central star and outer east west lobes observation logged angelfish cluster m71 <laughs> yay globs tiffany says wow we might have to stack this it is not showing up, is it? Is that it right in the middle? Very dim. Yeah, we were only off 5 hundredths of a degree. Well, it is there, isn't it? Just not very bright with 4 seconds. I wonder if we go up to 5 seconds real quick. If a 5 second exposure will bring it in a little better. Angelfish cluster. Okay. 
Observation log. That's definitely a yellow color, doesn't it? Philippe Le Chasseur in 1745 spans 27 light years. Huh, for a long time, they thought it was a packed open cluster. But modern photometric photometry has detected symptoms that make them think it's a globular. Huh. Okay, let's call it. Let's go to the glo gumball globular, M12. It does look yellow, Tiffany says. I know the tracking looks sloppy, doesn't it, <clears throat> Ray? I think... <clears throat> When we take our break, I'll go out and power cycle the mount. Because I think something has gone berserk with the mount. Because I'm getting really egg-shaped stars a lot. Let's hope that power cycling the mount will help. Okay, now, when we look at our list, that's all that remains. We're all on one page now. Oh, it is really sloppy looking. Look at that. Wow. Wonder if I've I wonder if we're gonna have to power cycle now. Let me look at what we've got here. This glob doesn't set until 11 a.m. So this could be a good time for our nap. Give it a firm talking to, Stu says. Mr. Another, good morning from Germany. Good to have you here. I wonder, since we're just at 36 degrees, if this is a good time. This is the highest object, and it's just 36, and everything else is below. Why don't I go out and power cycle them out, and we'll figure out what's wrong with this uh, tracking. And we'll take our nap. Let's see, so M30, we're probably not going to be able to see. It rises at, well now wait, it rises at 5.34 a.m. Oh, but wait, this is with my low horizon. Let's change to the... Let's change to Emerald Hills. Is that all I do? Let's go like that. Emerald Hills, yeah. Now let me do something that makes it refresh. Yeah, M30 rises at 5.34 a.m. And sunrise is at seven 
719. Surely that's not 534 above the building. Now that doesn't look terrible there, but that's because we're at the we're at Polaris. Set current position is zero position. Everything else looks to be right. Let's go back to the gumball globular again real quick just to check it. Let's go to Stellarium and double check that rise. So for M30, let's put in something like 6 a.m. on 4, 7, yeah. 6 a.m. And then let's search for M30. Well, I was going to say, see how that M30 is square behind that building. <laughs> it's like, how far do we have to go before it rises above that building? That's the thing. Whoop. So I got carried away. Right about say something like that. Six thirty. So the sun rises at Seven nineteen six thirty. I don't think it's going to work, but we can try it at six thirty, can't we? Okay, so let's take our nap now. Um, Ray's already hitting the sack. <laughs> yeah, Doug wants to get back to his orange chocolate. <laughs> What if we go, now how long, let's, let's add these all up and figure out how long it'll take us to get, it, to get through all these. From 84 to 120, that would be, but three of these are together. So 20, 23 objects, let's say, at four minutes. Can we do four minutes? two hours. So, man, gang, I hate to say it, I think it's going to have to be 4.30 to be safe. So we'll start back at 4.30, and that would at least give you an hour nap if you get to sleep in the next half hour. Deal? So anybody that wants to be on to the Messier Marathon uh, observing, Well, I got to power cycle the mount, though, Stu. Yeah, after I power cycle the mount and I get it going, then yeah, I'll leave something on. You're right. So we'll do an hour nap. And we'll start back at 4.30 Eastern time. So that's 90 minutes from right now we'll start back. Everybody good with that? There's still 11 of us here. Tiffany, you good with that? And I'll charge the mic again while we're sleeping. Let's go look at this gumball cluster and just see what it looks like. 
Yeah, there's still some kind of a thing going on. Well, these don't look as bad now. Do they? Oh, right there it is. So that's the gumball cluster, M12. Messier discovered it, 1764. A nebula without stars, he said. 16,400 light years from Earth, 75 light years wide. It's rather loosely packed for a glob. Was once thought to be a tightly concentrated open. Oh, look, there it's messed up. Yeah, I'm going to power Observation this. log. Okay, so we'll start with M10 at 430. Totally good with that. Might not be able to sleep. Way too much coffee. <laughs> uh oh. All right. We'll start back at 430. See you guys then. And first, I'll go power cycle this. So, shall I leave? I guess I'll leave the live stream running. And. I'll just take the mic apart and charge it while I'm power cycling. Okay. Good night, guys. See you back in 90 minutes. If you're watching this as a recording now, you could power scrub forward uh, when you start seeing some new activity, and it should be 90 minutes from now. Thanks.
And then let's close Nina. Thank you so much to the people who put Nina together. Now let's the definition of block in our large histogram. Let's also make our on-screen image of the definition of block in our large histogram. Let's also make our on-screen image. And let's get that title out of the way because that is wrong. That is supposed to be IC5146 or Barnard168. Dark Meta, good to have you back. <laughs> All right, so I don't know what looks like a cocoon here. Why, why did we call this a cocoon nebula? Maybe because this is an elongated hydrogen patch and this black thing in the middle is the worm inside of the cocoon, you think? Now these two bright stars are probably the two that are typically seen visually, but of course using electronically assisted astronomy with this Ross at 11, we're able to see a lot more of the cluster.
Observation log.
Okay, check one, two, three. You guys didn't go to sleep? <laughs> How long have you been here, Pete? Okay. Oh no. <clears throat> you started right when we broke. <laughs> Bummer. So sorry. <laughs> well, it's been boring, hasn't it? <clears throat> Pete, I have a I have a problem with <clears throat> my tracking or something. <clears throat> I don't know what's going on. I power cycled it, but There's something weird going on. Maybe we ought to finish this messy marathon first and then figure it out. <clears throat> but anyway, there's um, M10. Discovered by Messier. Nineteen arc minutes. 83 light years. Observation log. I wonder 
what's wrong with the, um, has it, have any of you guys figured out what's wrong with the mount? Look. Well, let's charge on for right now. Okay, ready for, that was M10, ready for M14. I did, I got some Z's. I think I slept for a, a full hour. Doesn't look like you guys slept at all. Huh. <laughs> P wants me to trade him the equatorial mount for an altazimuth. Do we have to do... Um, <clears throat> Stacking on all these, or can we just count them? I mean, that's a beautiful glob, right, Tiffany? We don't have to stack all these, do we? Selected. So these are... Um, South, southeast now. That's right by Ophiuchus. I am so sorry you guys didn't get any sleep. It's not very bright. And there's something wrong with the mount. What could it be? No, let's don't worry about it. Let's just forge on. M14, uh, it's a glob in Ophiuchus, discovered by Messier, 30,000 light years, several hundred thousand stars. Observation log. M107. Selected. So this is underneath Ophiuchus, <clears throat> more southerly. Some of these are pretty faint. Look at the stars and look at this glob. How did Messier see these? Very loose, mildly southern, the last of such objects in the Messier. Pierre Michel wasn't until 1947 that Helen Sawyer Hogg added it. Three other objects found by Meshian, the modern catalog, that have been contributed, suggested, so they're verified and added. Observation log. M9. Yeah, these are like 10th tenth, tenth magnitude. <clears throat> S 
selected. Pretty much the same location, right below Ophiuchus. Kills me the way they're just hanging there like. Hanging there like Christmas decorations. One of the near globular clusters, the center of the galaxy, 5,500 light years from the center, 25,000 light years from Earth. Observation log. M4. Yep, I'm with you, tiny one. Selected. This is in Scorpius. Again, it's almost due south. Cat's eye. Spider globular cluster. Discovered by Chasseau in 1745. It was the first globular cluster in which individual stars were resolved. Rather loose. does it almost looks like an open cluster doesn't it 75 light years across characteristic bar structure across its core right there 6,000 light years away it's the closest one to our solar system 12.2 billion years old apparently Many of these globs have more of a yellowish tinge, don't they? Observation log. Next is M80, another glob. Selected. Same basic location, Scorpius, Southerly. Discovered by Messier in 1781. It's one of his first discoveries. Tim, good to have you on board. Thanks, man. We're going to try to push through several hundred thousand stars. Look at that bright core in this case. Discovered by Messier. Uh, 95 light years across, several hundred thousand stars, one of the densest glo globs in the Milky Way, more than twice the distance of the galactic center in regions considered the galactic halo, hosts relatively many blue stragglers, much younger than the cluster itself. Maybe collided with another glob. Here's a bright core.
Observation log. What is the deal with this mount? Look at that. It's like it's at a different speed or something. <laughs> it is. You like globs, don't you, Tiffany? This next one is M19. Selected. A little bit east of south. But the same basic part of the sky. Still in Ophiuchus. One of the most oblate of the known globular clusters. What does oblate mean? Flat? Like flat? But it might be flat looking because of light being blocked. Medical terminology. Are you in the medical field? Observation log. Tiffany. Here's M62. Flickering globular. It is among the 10 most massive and luminous globular clusters in the Milky Way. Oh, an occupational therapist. Cool. Selected. M62. Same basic spot. Scorpius here. Here's Sagittarius. Ophiuchus. Observation log. Next is an open cluster, the butterfly cluster. M6. <clears throat> wow, it really does look like a butterfly, doesn't it? Look at that. So bright. Selected. It's getting closer to the Milky Way now. Just off of the um, the teapot of Sagittarius. So here's a lobe, and there's a lobe. Observation log. M7. An Easter bunny. You could be right there. You're right.
Okay, this is called Scorpion's Tail or Ptolemy's Cluster, NGC 6475. Scorpion's Tail. Selected. Right off the front of Sagittarius again, right in the heart of the Milky Way. This is an example of how I can't tell where the cluster stops. Observation log. Grim. Oblate is a sphere flattened at the poles like Jupiter due to spinning so fast. Prolate is a sphere elongated at the poles. Grim, are you the one from uh, Sky Searchers? I bet you are. That name is not too common in astronomy, is it? Anyway, there's seven. <laughs> this next is M11. It's the wild duck cluster. Selected. Wow, it's big. There's Scutum. Yeah, so it's an open cluster. Look how many stars. It's beautiful. Something wrong with the map. Observation log. Odd. Yes, I thought you might be, Graham. You've been so nice on that Sky Searchers forum. And you guys don't seem to have any kind of like um, edge. You're not edgy people. <laughs> you're, you're just kind. Pete, who is also on, Pete was the one who introduced me to Sky Searchers. Well, it's a great option. I love it. I'm enjoying it a lot. It's very laid back, very peaceful, you know? So is this M26, 25 stars. Boy, I would not have even thought of that as an open cluster. Observation log. Okay, you guys saw the Eagle Nebula during the break, I bet. Yes, friendly, Pete says. Um, <clears throat> this 
Sorry for the blinding light. Let me uh, find that picture again in case you missed it. So here, M16, today. It's gorgeous, right? There are those pillars of creation that you see that Hubble made famous. Guess these are the wings. Here's the head of the eagle. Look how I picked up additional nebulosity out here, the longer exposure. Famous pillars of creation. Okay, now we're headed to um, M17 and 18 via Tycho 06265-2495-1. M17, the Omega Nebula. Swan Nebula, called Horseshoe Nebula, and the Checkmark Nebula. It's an H2 region discovered by Philippe Lloyd de Chisseau in 1745. It is by some of the richest star fields of the Milky Way. So would that be this? And then M18, I bet that's this. Let's do a quick um, Yeah. So M17 here, M18 there. That's a pretty bright nebula actually if it can catch it on a three second exposure, right? Overall magnitude is seven. Selected. There's quite a lot more, um, quite a lot more nebulosity there. Let's stack this. Um, Seventeen and M eighteen. Well, it's a nice night for astronomy, huh? Oh my goodness, that's beautiful. This cluster does stand out just a little bit, but it's such a star-rich portion of the night sky. Anyway, look at this. I don't remember imaging this before, but I must have.
so much detail in these H2 regions of M17 and M18 makes a great companion. Observations for three objects logged. 80 seconds and it's that beautiful. The Omega Nebula. Man. I don't remember seeing this at Emerald of Skies before. I'm sure we must have, though. How big is that? It looks like um, seventh magnitude, 46 arc minutes. It's pretty big. It's uh, almost a degree. I think, you know, 60 arc minutes would be one degree, so huge. One hundred seconds. Who would have imagined that that's been up there all along, waiting for us to admire it? <laughs> Stu, Stu says we only see these objects once a year for a couple of minutes. <laughs> wow. Mm, always hunting for hidden gems. And so I missed the thing that's right in front of us, right, Stu? Look at all this nebulosity around it. So that's a three-minute image, and it looks like something right out of an astronomy magazine. Look at that. Boy, how many stars must that be? I mean, in that one frame, there must be more than a thousand, right? It does. Tiffany says, makes you just pause, makes you take a pause. With that cluster right there. Brilliant. Okay, let's head on over to, oh wait, we didn't uh, do an observation here. M17 is glorious. Amazing hydrogen to region, lots of detail. Observations for three objects logged. Okay, the next is M24. Small Sagittarius star cloud. This is actually pretty bright, magnitude 4.5. Selected. Look at that. Wow. That's huge. So what exactly are we looking at here? Is this just like a giant open cluster? So the whole thing is the open cluster?
Ricky says 2,107 stars. Stu says EA is simply amazing. Such a leap in tech. <laughs> so should we stock this or is this... Is what we see, is, is this what it is? Just a giant, giant cluster of lots and lots of stars. A star cloud in the constellation of Sagittarius, approximately 600 light years wide, cataloged by Messier, should not be confused with the nearby large Sagittarius star cloud. It's one of only three Messier objects that are not actually a deep sky object. It fills a space of significant volume to a depth of 10,000 to 16,000 light years. It's the most dense concentration of individual stars visible using binoculars with around 1,000 stars visible within a single field of view. This is M24. So it's not a messy. Oh, man. That's incredible, isn't it? It does look better stacked, doesn't it? With a longer exposure like this. Okay, that's striking, isn't it? That is just striking. Look at these dark sections. Are those dark nebulae? They are. Stu says, glorious. Yeah, that's just like over the top, isn't it? It's just breathtaking. Wow. The whole thing is a giant star cloud. Observation log. Um, Graham is asking if we're controlling the map with the event log program you're using or SharpCap. Um, the map is connected to SharpCap, but we're not exerting any ongoing, oh, unless that button. It says tracking, doesn't it? Do you think I've hit that by mistake or something? I can't tell if it's off or on. So is that off? I bet we had hit that button by mistake. Let's stop the livestock now. No, that <clears throat> that just talked to the mount. So the SharpCap is reporting what the mount is doing, but the mount's being controlled <clears throat> by the Ioptron commander, see? It's not being controlled by SharpCap, Graham. 
And then we're using Astral Planner to point it Five percent battery left in the mouse. That's sad. Okay, off we go to M25, which is otherwise known as IC4725. It's an open cluster in Sagittarius. Philip Le de Chez <laughs> 1745. There are some obscuring features near it, a dark lane passing near the center. 67 million years old, estimated mass of 1,937 solar masses. That's right, your mic, your mouse, your voice. <laughs> This is a cool open cluster, isn't it? Doesn't say how many members. Observation log. Selected. right above Sagittarius. Next is M23. <clears throat> Another open cluster. Selected. So this is east of south, also right below Ophiuchus. Messier discovered it in 1764. Estimated 169 up to 414 members. around 330 million years old. Boy, after, after we Observation saw... Observation log. Yes, Astro Planner is definitely worth it, Graham. After we saw M16 and M17, these clusters just look a little bit humble, don't they? I'm sorry to say that, but they're just, that M17 was over, just overwhelmingly beautiful. Okay, now we head to a three for one special. M20, M21, plus M8, all in one frame. <clears throat> We're going to want to stack this. Boy, isn't that something when you first look at this frame? It might be a little nebulosity here, but Nothing else really stands out, so now let's see when we stack it. M8, M20, and M21.
<laughs> Stu says, if they're all in one frame, why didn't Messi discover them at the same time? Oh my goodness. Well, it's because he didn't have a telescope with this wide of a field of view, I bet. I bet his little four inch deal. Oh my goodness, look at this. This is just a treat, isn't it? That's one single 20 second exposure. <laughs> so crazy. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, you're right. Tiffany says they just keep getting better, and Pete says, wow. Okay, so in 21... Nicknamed Webb's Cross. It's an open cluster, relatively young and tightly packed. A few blue giant stars that have been identified in the cluster, but mainly small dim stars. So is that over here? I'm just guessing this must be M21 here. Yeah, so there's the open cluster M21. And then this would be M20, the Trifid Nebula. Call the Triffid, I guess, because it can be divided into three parts. Look how there's a bluish reflection nebula side and a hydrogen alpha side. Selected. There's Webb's cross. And it's funny how. It appears that the Trifid Nebula doesn't have two names. In other words, the blue is not a separate, a separately named object. H2 region in the northwest of Sagittarius star forming region discovered by Messier on June 5th, 1764. It names, its name means three lobe. The object is an unusual combination of an open cluster of stars, an emission nebula, that's the relatively dense reddish pink portion, a reflection nebula, the main NNE blue portion, and a dark nebula, the apparent gaps in the former that caused the trifurcated appearance, also designated Barnard 85. So this dark nebula that's dividing the hydrogen alpha cloud does have a separate name, Barnard 85. The most massive star that has formed in this region is HD 16449-2A, an 07.53 star with a mass more than 25, 20 times the sun. And the star is surrounded by a cluster of approximately 3,100 young stars. So that would be that bright HD 1644-92A. Yeah. 
not named in Stellarium kind of bugs me when these things are not named. Pete, how can we fix that? Like, this is a pretty major star in a way. But these are not named. Is there any way to fix that? That one is. That's the 1644-92 star that it just talked about, this one here. But the other is just called star. Is there any way to fix that, Pete? Do I not have enough stars loaded or what? Anyway, it's beautiful. And then how about this? That's M8, the Lagoon Nebula, a giant interstellar cloud in the constellation Sagittarius, an emission nebula and an H2 region discovered by Giovanni Hodierna before 1654 is one of only two star-forming nebulae faintly visible to the eye from the mid-northern latitudes. It's about four to 6,000 light years from Earth. It spans 90 minutes by 40 minutes, so a degree and a half long. 110 by 50 light years contains a number of bulk globules, dark collapsing clouds of protostellar material, the most prominent of which have been cataloged by Barnard as 8889 and 296. So that must be these little, these little clouds here, dark clouds. Oh, that's right. Stellarium can perform a Simbad search. That's right. Good thinking. So M20 only gets 15 degrees high from your location, Graham. Remind us where you are, Graham. You must be in another place in UK. Let's uh, go over and look at this. Let's see with Selected. Oh, I did it again. Yeah. So these bulk globules don't appear to be named here in Stellarium. also includes a funnel-like or tornado-like structure caused by a hot O-type star that emanates ultraviolet light, heating and ionizing gas on the surface of the nebula. The Lagoon Nebula also contains, at its center, a structure known as the Hourglass Nebula, so named by John Herschel. That must be that. So is this, is that the hourglass? Or this, maybe this. This is the hourglass. Southeastern UK. 
So you're not that far from the Isle of Wight. So that's the hourglass. 6530. So with that marked, I can add that thanks to Pete's cool EAA control panel and then mark an observation on that. Pete, that's a game changer. Woohoo! Um, found within the lagoon Observation log. Words. Can't describe the, the incredible details of the Lagoon Nebula. These buck globules deserve more study. as does Herschel's Hourglass Nebula. It's a showstopper. Pete says Graham is on the North Island. <laughs> You're saying England is the North Island. <laughs> um, M20 is equally gorgeous and M21 adds to the glitter. Observation wow, I'm sorry we got a little carried away. Sorry we got a little carried away here, gang, but these are just beautiful, huh? What a frame. My goodness, what a frame. Doesn't have to, doesn't have to be one of the most brilliant frames we've ever seen, gang. Okay, we have to, we have to forge on though. Yep, Tiffany agrees. We have to forge on. Okay, this next object is back to globular clusters. So I'm just going to use the little sequence about set exposure to three seconds. And we'll zip through these. Here's the great Sagittarius cluster. Nicknamed the Cracker Jack Cluster. Selected. Right above the teapot lid of Sagittarius. And it's a nice globular. This is an interesting asterism here. Is this 
Oh, I see, we skipped M28. This is M22. Now let's go back Observation to log. M28. Wow, this is a small one, isn't it? Selected. Tiny, comparatively speaking. Again, right above the teapot lid, it's 11 arc minutes. Still has its own beauty. That has a greenish sort of tinge to it, doesn't it, Tiffany? Observation log. On to M69. Selected. Inside of the teapot. I thought it did. You have to be our color appreciator. This is very faint. What is the... Oh, it's nine. Discovered by Messier. He was searching for an object Described by Lakai, thought he had rediscovered it, but it's unclear if Lakai actually described M69. <laughs> you keep getting woozy off the mad slewing of the telescope. <laughs> Stu's getting seasick. <laughs> Faint, tiny. Observation log. M70. Discovered by Charles Messier, 1780. Okay, Hale Bop was discovered near here in 1995. Selected. These are so tiny. What is that little thing? <laughs> I'm sorry, it's like chasing a Starlink 3612 just floated through our field of view. Look how tiny. But, to be fair, each of these could be stacked. But just to give an idea, here's the full frame of the APS-C. It just looks like, at first glance, it looks like a fuzzy star, doesn't it? I have a question. How did Messier know that that was... I mean, how discerning did the guy have to be? Yeah, looking at this frame that we have, these pinpoint stars do look more pinpoint. You're right. But still, with a 3.5 inch, 4 inch scope with a metal mirror, that's quite a feat. Observation log. 
<laughs> Stu. Stu says our motors on our mount are going to need a rest after tonight. <laughs> All right, next is M54. Selected. Inside the teapot still. Inside the teapot of Sagittarius. Wow. Look at that. That definitely just looks like one fuzzy star. In fact, if we were just a slight bit out of focus, that's what it would be. That's 100% optical right there. This is, um, well, it says it's nine arc minutes. Boy, it sure doesn't look nine arc minutes, does it? Observation log. <laughs> Graham points out the skies were darker in his day. That's true. Back then, I read that in Paris, there hadn't been any electricity run yet. So if there were street lights, they were lit as torches, you know. So it was a very comparatively speaking, very dark sky. Stu says, this is the definition of a deep sky object. It could almost look like a fingerprint or a bit of grit. And you're right, Stu. There it is in the full frame. On to M55. Selected. Pete, if you get a chance to listen back at the video anytime, we did give homage to you and this amazing invention of yours, this control panel. Honestly, it's a game changer. It's just, it completely changes. Right, they don't move across the sky. Good points, too. Uh, fingerprints don't move on the sky. It, it, it unites together. Oh, my goodness, look at this. We're going to stack this. It unites together these three pieces of software like never before. Prep for imaging only. This is M55. Well, for what it's worth, on our real live Emerald Hills sky, it says it's at zero. M30, I mean, is at zero. So that that's awesome. Yeah, we got a lot more out of this by going to a 20 second exposure. It's just a lot more beautiful. This is M55. It really needed the benefit of a 20 second exposure. Observation log. Okay. Got to push on, gang. M75 is next. Wow, there's a new version coming. I can't imagine. What, how it could be better, I can't imagine. 
Selected. Okay, this is even tinier. Oh, look, here goes uh, Starlink 3120 is going to come through our frame. Mm, I don't see it anywhere. But these are three second exposures. Surely it's going to look like a trail here in a second. Nope. Anyway, I'm trusting that's it right there, right? Yep, M75 right there. How did Messier live without deep sky image annotation? I'll never know. Boy, if Tiffany is still with us, Tiffany, that's got to take the cake. Six arc minutes. That's the tiniest. M75. Observation log. On to the great Pegasus cluster, M15. M15. How's our sky looking? Still good, right? Boy, look, you can see the Milky Way. Really nice. Look at that. You can see the Milky Way on the sky cam. Here's this, right? M15. It is nice. Look at the bright core. Discovered by Moraldi in 1746, 12.5 billion years old, plus or minus a billion. It's one of the oldest known globular clusters. It's about 35,700 light years from Earth, 175 light years in diameter. Earth orbiting satellites Uhuru and Chandra have detected two bright X-ray sources in this cluster. So it's an X-ray cluster. Observation log. On to M2. Itty bitty is right. Stu says, thanks, Elon, for that Starlink satellite. It's in Aquarius, discovered by Jean Dominique Mahaldi in 1746. 175 light years in diameter, one of the largest known globular clusters. Rich, compact, significantly elliptical, 12.5 billion years old and one of the older globular clusters associated with the Milky Way galaxy. Contains 150,000 stars in the Southern Galactic Cap. This placed it right below the South Pole of the Milky Way. Wow. Each of these globulars could be studied, you know, in detail. They how common are X-ray clusters? I think 
X-ray sources are common, but I don't know how common they are in clusters. Maybe Pete or Graham might know. Twelve point five apparent billion years old. I mean, if the universe, Observation log. if the universe was previously thought to be fourteen billion, this is going back. In terms of the apparent age of the universe, this is going back, really, really lots closer to the dawn of time. Right. Now we're going to go see M72, M73. Uh, it's like a two for one special. And we're going to get there via HD 358.043 so that we can point at these two globulars. Or actually, one of them is a globular, one's an open cluster in the same frame. Okay, look at M73, and then up here is M72, a glob. Let's get those turned off so we can see them. Boy, we're going to have to stack this. M72, a globular in the southwest, very mildly southern constellation of Aquarius discovered by Pierre Michin in 1780. This is M72 and M73. And M73, an asterism of four stars discovered by Charles Messier, who originally described the objects as a cluster of four stars with some nebulosity. Much later observations by John Herschel could not find any nebulosity. Herschel noted the designation M73 as a cluster was questionable. Nonetheless, he included it, and Dreyer included it. It shows how a mistake can be continued by later researchers who don't want to part ways with history. It continued all the way to 2002 when Odin Kirchen and Subarin published an analysis of the high resolution spectra. They demonstrated that the distances of these six stars were so very different and they were moving in different directions. Therefore, the stars are only an asterism. That's M73. So that's this. This is only an asterism. This is a real globular, M72. Observations for three objects log. M73. I'm going to uncheck the add to associated objects. I'm going to say asterism just for M73. Observation log. Good job, Pete. Great invention. Okay, let's go back to three seconds. And go see if we can find M30. How close are we? It says two degrees altitude. All right, let's select it. Yeah, there's M30. 
it's behind the building I'm in. All of which is to say, Pete does, uh, I mean, Stu, Pete is throwing the question to you about how common are X-ray clusters. Guys, this is the last remaining Messier object. What do you think of that? There's a lot to like about this picture, this sky view. Let me go ahead and make this bigger. First, look at the Milky Way. Look at the Starlink. Is that not a beautiful Milky Way? Wow. And then here in this building, that's the front entrance. And that's just a, a little, very soft utility light. And let me see, get oriented here. That's a doorway with a utility light behind it. That is my window. The window of the room I'm in right now. So I'm going to go walk to that window and shine a flashlight out of it. I'm going to use red. So can you see the red light? That's my window. Wow. I got over just in time to see the last of it. <laughs> Tiffany says we're waving to you. <laughs> Yeah, Tiffany, you're right. The last one. We did them all in nine hours. It's crazy, isn't it? We missed, remember, because, I mean, we were here in time for M74 and M77, but they just were blinded by the sunset. They were impossible uh, by the sunset because it's April. So... We're already at 107, right? Yeah, because we're just missing three objects. We're at 107. If we can just pick up M30, we'll be at 108. I think this is really beautiful though. But that's the building that M30 is behind right now. And then the sad thing is, not only does it have to rise above the building, it has to rise above the tree. The first year that we did um, <laughs> yeah, the first year that we did Messi Marathon, I had the telescope set up here in this location. But when I knew that M30 was going to be impossible, I actually picked up the tripod telescope and all and heaved it over here, way over toward the right, about maybe 200 more feet to get on the 
to get around the building. And the sad thing is, at that point, M30 is at the horizon. But the question was, do we change the location of the entire observatory just for this one object once a year? And my thought was, let's don't. By the way, can you see how there's more and more light <coughs> beginning to show up back here? That's sad. Okay, let's put this back like we found it. Roughly. Go back to this very informed view here, which is where we think M30 is. Boy, that's sad. Yeah, it's uh, it's five fifty six, and. I thought when it said three degrees, I thought that was supposed to be three degrees above the the horizon that was the custom horizon. But I know it's coming up on 6 a.m., right, Tiff? I thought that this three degrees, now it's at four degrees, I thought that was four degrees above the custom horizon, but apparently it's four degrees above the real horizon, sadly. So anyway, we almost relocated the entire observatory just for M30 but we didn't um the reason we didn't is because it would have just made it that much weirder location for the master plan of the property. So it had to do with the distance from this building, for instance. Stu says 107 is fine by me. It's 107 more than I otherwise would have seen. <laughs> Tiffany says M30 must be flattered <laughs> because you're right. Stu, I think you're right. Why do because you're in the middle of like supper time, aren't you? You're ready to go eat dinner in Twaranga. But ma'am, the distance would have been a bigger hassle. Getting power there would have been a bigger hassle. And by the master plan of the property, it's in the middle of a parking lot. And so I had a conflict of interest. Here I am supposed to be the president of this organization and try to care about following the master plan. But man, we would love to have that observatory located so we could see M30 in a Messier Marathon once a year. <laughs> so. So unfortunately, the master plan won out. It's 10 p.m. in Twaranga? No way. I thought we were 12 hours apart. A flat earth. Except then, how would it have spun around and kept gravity going? I guess gravity is because it's 
a great big rock. So you're right, Stu. Anyway, Stu, you got to go to bed. All daylight savings started for you. Here's the scope. You can see it's pretty much pointed right at the horizon in our poor man's scope cam. The turtle provides the gravity, of course. You got Pete cracking up, Stu. Okay. If you're watching this as recording, I am so sorry. <laughs> Please forgive us. But let's, for a moment, run time forward. And find the exact moment. Okay, according to the photorealistic horizon, the exact moment would be 626. However, I also have that line, which I think is more accurate. If the line is correct, it would be 645. And by them, see the sun rises at 719. So I think It'll be very, very, very difficult anyway. <laughs> Stu. Stu says, you know, M30 is just another glob. I've, I'm sure you guys have seen it before. Brace your eyes. It's going to be brighter here. Um, here we go. M30. I don't mean to insult it. Boy, there's so many weapons named M30. I'm going to have to say Messier 30. It is a nice glob. But getting it to look like that 15 minutes from sunrise is impossible. <laughs> Stu. Stu says, gasp, just another glob? <laughs> I know. But I've never seen it like this. To me, it always just looks like just another glob because the sun is always interrupting it. Sadly. Not a lot of... This is what you call a low signal-to-noise ratio, right? We have Zero signal. It is beautiful, Tiffany, you're right. I don't 
don't even know if it's... It is Hubble. You're right, Tiffany. So I see we've still got 11 in the stream. <clears throat> of course, one of those would be mine. So 10 others. If any of you folks do need to dash, like Stu, if you'd like to dash, 10 o'clock, you're beat. We would totally understand. Three a.m. in California. <laughs> Tiffany says, "I just had my first yawn. Coffee's wearing off." It's funny how you can do a messy marathon from California and and really go to bed at at three forty-five a.m. No fair. I actually have a soccer game today. It starts at nine. So I need to leave at 8.15 for it. As long as I get back to the house by 8, I could still make it, I think. So I'm in okay shape. And then I'll sleep after soccer. This is like um, watching the real-time movie of the glacier head down the mountain, isn't it? Like I say, I don't know for sure, for sure, 100% when this will pop out. Because, like I say, I loaded the trees in, and I did, I loaded the trees a little bit low, because I thought it would be fun to see what's coming up over the real horizon, and I put the line where I thought the horizon is really supposed to be. So if my calculations are right, then unfortunately it's 645, gang. So if, if you need to go, that's another 35 minutes. I think I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for it. But you guys... Oh, Stu says he's good. He's good till the stream ends. Tiffany, you're going to head off then, right? Thanks for being with us through the night, though, Tiffany. Don't forget to fill out the form at the website, and we'll, we'll definitely put you into the SEDS page with this. Oh, you're staying. Good. <laughs> Oh, you're saying good luck in the soccer game. I got it. You know, uh, Pete and Graham, if you're both still with us, I, I think it's fun that, Pete, that you introduced me to Sky Searchers, and I met Graham on Sky Searchers, and it appears, from what I understood from you two guys, you actually interacted first here. It's kind of like a... 
roundabout way. Stu says, I'm here for moral support. Go, Doug, go. Graham says, brilliant. Thanks. I look forward to reading your report on the TSS, the Sky Searchers. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you, Graham. Well, I'll do it then. If you, if you think it's worth putting there, I'll do it. Well, I'm, I'm sorry I missed those first two, but if we were to have been able to do this in March, we would have captured them. But then, in March, I don't think we would have caught M30. Because as you guys know, I'm sure you guys know, what is it? Pete, you might have this memorized. What is the sky shift like? Is it eight degrees every month? I forget. Well, we should be able to figure this out. If it's, let me think. This is making my head hurt to try to think this through. If it's 360 degrees around and 12 months, then shouldn't it roughly be 30 degrees per month? Could that be right? That the sky shifts 30 degrees every month? Which would be a sixth I guess that's right, isn't it? That seems too much. So in other words, about one degree farther sinking into the west per night. I guess that could be, couldn't it? So from one month's time, between the times that we tried this in March and now, in one month's time, we've lost 30 degrees of altitude. Yeah, Stu says, 6 a.m. math can't be right. He says, small world after all. Graham says, yeah, 30 degrees per month. So see, it's no wonder that we lost M74 and M77 because they shifted 30 degrees deeper into the sunset. Yikes. But that's why we at least stand a half chance of catching M30 because it has shifted 30 degrees toward us in the night. Stu is like hearing the Disney song. It's a small world after all. <laughs> well, you can see it has risen there. It's higher. Let's go back to the, oh, look, what is that? That's got to be something. That's the live view. I'll tell you what that is, I bet. I hope that that's M30. It's over the roof, but now it's not clear of the trees. It is M30! How do I know this? Well, let me tell you how I know this. First, I know this because, look, it's almost exactly in the center of frame. And the scope is just that good. It's going gonna, it's gonna to put the object almost exactly in the center of the frame. The second reason I know that is because I recognize it. It has that orange blob look. It's the dot, <laughs> Stu says. The third reason is because it is in the shape 
of a globular cluster. Woohoo! I tell you what, guys, 108 out of 110 is not shabby in this business. Okay, so it says it's a globular cluster of stars in southeast southern California, Capricornus, discovered by Charles Messier in 1764, 93 light years across. The estimated age is 12.9 billion years, billion years apparently. It forms a mass of about 160,000 times the mass of the sun. The cluster has passed through a, dy a dynamic process called core collapse and now has a concentration of mass at its core about a million times the sun's mass per cubic parsec. This makes it one, I think a parsec is like three light years. This makes it one of the highest density regions in the Milky Way galaxy. Stars in such close proximity will experience a high rate of interactions that can create binary star systems even, as well as a type of star called a blue straggler that is formed by mass transfer, a process of mass segregation may have caused the central region to gain a greater proportion of the higher mass stars, creating a colorful gradient that increasing with increasing blueness toward the middle of the cluster. We first spied M30 around 6, 14 a.m., peeking up over the building amidst the trees. We could see its globular disk shape, which distinguished it, I'm trying to make this sound really, really scientific, from a pinpoint star. See? Yeah. Uh, however, there were very few other stars visible so we couldn't plate solve to be sure. But it was in the exact center of our frame, our field of view. Okay. Observation logged. Close to the center. Okay, so we've logged it. So, I mean, we're going to say it's official. If you guys need to go. Yeah, I don't think we can do DSA because we don't have enough stars, do we, Pete? Let's try. No harm in trying, right? So first we would have to say plate solve, solve only. Ah, <gasps> it did solve, Pete, you're a genius. Woohoo! Oh wait, it's not. It's Hipparchus 107-128. M30 is here, supposedly. Rats! <laughs> I thought we had it. There is a kind of a faint glow there between those branches. 
Wow, isn't it? Oh, now you can see it. In between branches, there's a very faint glow there. Boy, you can see those branches silhouetted so well, can't you? That's 250% of our optical zoom. I don't think we have enough stars to stack, do we? Can try it. I don't want to be the person that says, I don't think so. Let's try it though. Let's see. So do we go with the full 20 second stack? Um, prep for imaging only. M30. Right here. Right? Right there? or up here. Yeah, right there. Hallelujah. <laughs> that grin you see on my face is because we're looking at M30. Hey, thanks for the input. Astronomy is a team sport. See, uh, Pete wanted us to do deep sky image annotation and Mr. Another said try stacking. So there's M30. Your last glob of the night, Tiffany. Boy, just in time. Now it's uh, not able to stack anymore. Not enough there to align it. Man, can you believe it, guys? Okay, this wraps up 108 Messier objects out of 110, losing only the Phantom, which is appropriate, M74, and the Squid, M77. Uh, we will be sending this in to the SEDS people, so don't forget, if you were with us the whole night, just fill out that form at Emerald Hill Skies. And thank you all for making this fun. Um, Tiffany saying here, Tiffany says, Doug, thank you so much. What a blast. Congrats. But congrats to you guys because this would have been so lonely. I'm not sure I would have done it, but 
you guys make it fun. You, you do. And I'm going to go back to the house and celebrate and maybe catch one more hour of sleep now. And uh, I hope you can get a good night's sleep still, Tiffany, at least a part night's sleep. Thanks, Pete and Graham, for joining us from the, uh, the great country of UK. Of course, uh, Mr. Nother, I think you're over in, remind me, is it Germany? And uh, of course, Stu from Twaranga. And really, everybody else who's joined us, if you're watching us via a, lot, a recording, in a way, you were part of this journey as well, just as much, because you have fought through the hours with us. So we're going to stop the live stream now, but I hope you realize we're not going to stop the adventures. And do subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, please. Emerald Hill Skies, you can find that. Of course, you're watching it on YouTube. Uh, and if you like content like this and want to hit that, that uh, bell, you can be notified whenever we go live. And you can always do a thumbs up if you want, if you enjoy this kind of content. And it does help get in everybody else's uh, dashboard of their own, their own YouTube videos. So thanks again. Thanks to God for making all these objects. Uh, Pete, one more time, thank you for making this possible with the EAA control panel. It's, it's a game changer. It speeds up so many processes and makes possible stuff that otherwise wouldn't have been possible. So Stu says thanks to all the chat. See you next time. Thanks again for making it so fun. God bless and good night. It's hard to go.